Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Our guest today is Byron Robinson. Byron, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready. Byron is a renowned business magnate and major boutique player in the financial service industry, the diverse background on finance, sports, and real estate. Before entering the business world, Byron was a world-class athlete competing in the Olympic Games in the 400-meter hurdles. Today, Byron is the CEO of a holding company that houses both the investment bank Robinson Company Banking and the asset management firm, Robinson Asset Management. His other interests include physical fitness, chess, and the arts. He has received numerous awards and honors, has been featured in prominent media outlets for success in business and his commitment to excellence. Byron, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. The honor is all mine. And um, that made me sound a lot better than I think I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's an honor, though. So, Byron, let's talk about chess first. Yeah. What age were you when you first started playing chess? I used to play, um, I'm not a uh, Magnus by any stretch, but um, my earliest memory playing chess was maybe six years old. Um, my dad would be off at work. My mom would be home with, with me and my brothers. And um, that's back when the internet was, uh, what do you call it? It makes all those doubts. The them. AOL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, would, I would play uh, really any game that I can play on a computer. Uh, which I, that's how I learned how to play computer games, by the way. And um, chess was one of them. I think I go like Pogo or like chess123.com around that age. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was just moving pieces around that. And I would play, I would play chess and checkers. And um, I just played on and off since then my entire life. And so how, how did you stay so interested in chess? Like what made you keep playing over and over again versus like most kids play chess for a little bit and they, they quit? Um, I like anything that's mentally stimulating. And chess is a, is, a, is a game that the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And there's so many nuances and, and variations that uh, it's like the deeper you get into it, it's, uh, it's like self-fulfilling. Uh, if you have a mom that's like interested in solving puzzles and putting things together, uh, you once you get a bite into chess, I, I don't think you ever let it go because it's just, it, it's a deep rabbit hole and it never ends. How often do you play now? Every day. Every day? Yeah. Like you play the chess game, you actually play people or like? I play people. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do chess tournaments every Monday. Um, I rotate between, or I try to rotate depending on the work schedule, um, whether it's going to be online or uh, in person in Seattle. Okay. So there's a pretty big chess community here in Seattle, I'm guessing? Uh, like sort of, kind of. I don't know what to compare it to because yeah. I didn't do this in Texas or Virginia where I previously lived. Um, it's robust, though. I mean, it's a serious chess community yeah. here, for sure. So what, what, do you, what do you say your skill level is from, like, a skill of 1 to 10? What, what is, what's in a chess? Is it, like, the like master's level or different levels to it? I'm not a title player. Okay. Um, you, you know, I do think, though, if I never did sports, and, or specifically if I never ran track um, and I just played chess, I think I think I would be I am. Oh, I think I would max out there. But I'm not a title player. I'm not a serious player. In fact, if any random – I was – so I, I went skiing um, two weeks back and then one of the guys that was with us um, was talking chess. And I, I asked him a few questions to see if he actually played. He didn't play, well, yeah. he, you know, casually. Yeah. And um, I, I told him I played sometimes and he instantly wanted to play right there, mm -hmm. like right then and there. Yeah. And I was, this is why I don't, I don't even like talking about it with people. But um, I mean, we played, I beat him. Um, so I'm, I'm competitive, but I'm not a title player by any okay. stretch. I, I, I mean, I, I do know a few lines though. Yeah. You ever watched a TV show? I think it's called The Gambit. It was a show. Queen's Gambit? Yeah. That, never seen it. Yeah. I know this about, but I've never seen it. Yeah, that's a real good show. My best part, my best part in there was like, she went to some high school, all, all, all boys high school to play chess. Yeah. And and all these 16 players thought they were going to play six different people. Like, who would play you playing that girl? Like, and she and she'd be all 16 of them. Like, she'll go table to table, just like smoking, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not that. <laughs> or maybe if they were really bad, I'd be able to do that, but not really. I'm 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 competitive. I'm not yeah. title by any stretch. Yeah. So next, let's move to the arts. Yeah. Any certain arts you're like most interested in, or classical European art? Okay, like yeah. the sculptures, the painting, or just everything. Um, I'll entertain uh, sculptures, but preferably paint. Okay. Um, I just love it. I you know, I find it to be kind of uncommon because the more I talk to people about, uh, especially the art museums in Seattle, haven't found one I like. By the way, yeah. I don't do any contemporary any of the stuff. I think. 
<laughs> to me, it's just contemporary art is just lines on a, a canvas. I can't get with that. And I also don't like the um the pieces where it's like a banana, a can, a bottle of water, you know. I don't like statement pieces. I I, I read a book on um uh, uh what's his name? The famous artist out of Italy, the most famous one. He did the Mona Lisa. Oh man, uh, Da Vinci? Yeah, Leonardo Da Vinci. I read a book on him and um that really opened my eyes to how talented like these 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 artists are and were. Um what they were were functional geniuses across multiple topics. And they just um, concentrated it and displayed it in the form of art on a canvas. And after reading that book, it really made me get a, a greater appreciation for it. Uh, and I read that, I think, in uh, 2015, somewhere around there. And ever since then, I've just been all in on it. So you, you spent some time in Europe. Were you able to do any, any of the art museums in Europe? No. Nah. Well, um, every time in Europe, it was for a track. Um, and no, nah, we... Any any track athlete would tell you when you when you're traveling for a track meet, you don't have time really to have fun. It's yeah. there for work. You, you got to go back. There's so many great museums, like the Rice Museum and you know Amsterdam. Have you been? Yeah. Oh wow. I've been there. I, I pretty much all the museums in Europe I've been to. You know. W which one is your favorite? Man, I want to say the Rice Museum. Rice Museum. Yeah, Rice. It's the one where um, it's in Amsterdam. I can't remember the guy that he had this penny called our Night Watch. That's real famous. I like that one. The okay. ones the ones in Florence are really good too. You know. I would imagine Florence yeah, definitely for sure. Good. Of course, the Louvre's great, but Louvre's just so huge, right? There's no way to do it in one day. Like you've got even nothing if you lived in in Paris, you can see everything, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, once I um, become of more means, I definitely want to be a full time collector. Uh, and I know that's very stereotypical for bankers to to start collecting art after a while. But uh, listen, one thing that I can tell you as I get older now is that the things that I used to judge as a child about what older older people would do. Uh, I'm starting to understand why older people do it now. Yeah, definitely. So next question. So you're talking about, you know, Leo da Vinci, all those people from the older days who are like geniuses. Do you think humans are getting like smarter or better evolved or we're or, or we pronounce the same humans who were like thousands of years ago? Um uh this isn't backed by any data, but um I, I think the human intelligence has been stagnant. I mean, there's been geniuses throughout the entire history of time. Only thing that changes the um, resources available, the technology, to or I mean, sometimes you can be a genius but just not have the right fit. You not you could be right person, wrong place. I actually think that's that's the majority of the case. Most most geniuses, most athletes, most anything fall into that category. Like you have a certain innate uh, ability, but you just you're not in the right environment to bring it out. Um, so uh, to answer your question more specifically, though, I I, I think human intelligence is just stagnant, um, really ever. Ever since Christ, to be honest. Yeah. I definitely believe, like, not saying Elon Musk is a genius or Davis is a genius, that's not my place to say, but I definitely think if they traded places, they would still be as successful as they were in their own generation. As as successful? Yeah. You think so? You think Elon Musk will be as successful today as then potentially like 200 years ago? I, I think so. Interesting. But just in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like obviously, he wouldn't be building no Teslas or going to space. Yes, yeah, it's plausible. He'll be, he'll be doing whatever's outside, right out, because that's what he's doing now. Whatever's right outside, you know, humanly possible, he'll be pushing that. It'd just be relative to his time period. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I think he would be like, you know, he would be pushing to get to the new world instead of 1642, maybe year 1600 or something, right? Yeah. Something like that. That's scary. That's an interesting um, thought experiment. What would Elon Musk be doing 200 years ago? I don't know. So next question. And I saw this on, a, a, I think, Cora one time. Somebody asked this question. You know, there's like people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, you know, people rich, famous, wealth, means whatever, and they're doing pretty well. The thought experiment was like, everyone goes to zero and everyone gets $25,000. Like, like Elon Musk doesn't have the network, you know, none of that stuff. He gets twenty five thousand dollars. Okay. And the question was, will the successful people be still be successful? Absolutely. That's, a, that's, that's everyone has entered the same way. Yeah. And why do you think that? I, I would press a party. That I don't think it. I know it. Um, because success isn't success isn't a chance game. It's not. It's not winning the lottery. It's is uh is cause and effect. Is I do X, and then I get Y out. You know, um, as a common uh, misconception, uh, if I may, from not successful people, 
um, you know, it wouldn't matter. There's a certain type. There's a certain. There are certain type of people. It wouldn't matter what you threw at them: divorce, uh, loss of a family member, uh, car accident. You fill in the blank, and they just can't be stopped. Um, that's the that's the, the successful people. It is the uh, unsuccessful people who don't know, who don't realize that that it's more within than exterior. That um, they point for reasons to why something didn't work out, and it's the fact that they're even focusing on that to begin with is the reason why they're in the situation that they are right now. Um, but no, nah, I listen. I would die on that hill if someone put a gun in my head and told me to change my mind on that. I'm just gone. I like I I I genuinely do believe that. I know that to be true. I know it. And uh, most of my peers, all the such people that I know personally, everything that I read about, um, it, it wouldn't matter what you threw at them. They're going to be successful. Um, it, I mean, to, to, to circle back to the time period um, that we talked about with, with Elon specifically, um, that's the reason why he was still, you know, because he, 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 is, um, he has a successful, like, tick. He has the knack for it. Um, it wouldn't matter. Why do you think some people have this drive, others don't? You think it's like upbringing, like this internal something they have, or what do you yeah, think this, it is? it's this is the classic nature nurture conversation. Um, I, I guess ultimately, when you bring it to his uh, logical conclusion, is is a mixture to varying degrees. Uh, I think that again, if you if you're mentally in the right place, it wouldn't matter where you are. You're gonna you're gonna make something happen, no matter what. But you can't ignore the fact that, uh, especially like with young children, that you do need the environment to bring it out a lot. So you, you definitely do. Because um, I, I can tell you personally, like the environment that I was in was, was geared towards sports coming up when I was, when I was a child. But um, if I was in um, more, uh, if I was in environments that would bring out more thinking, uh, I mean, I would have... <laughs> I'll be so far ahead in business right now than I am right now. I can tell you that. So you have people like Kobe Bryant, right? Do you think he was too extreme? Can you be too extreme in being successful? Like you had to push drive and like the cost of like not paying, spending time with your kids, your family, or this, is that just the cost you have to pay? I think everybody's different, man. Um, I mean, listen, uh, you're, you're talking to someone who lives, I mean, I live my entire life on the extreme, man. I, <laughs> I max everything out. I, I I work now style. I work all the time. Um, that's just what I do. So I, I'm very biased. Um, listen, this is what I believe, especially as a dad. I'm not a dad yet, but I think about it every day. I think um, if I had to choose between the extremes of being the always at home, Cheeto eating, always on the couch, you know, football, you know, you, you know that that guy, the American dad versus being like a Kobe of the world or whoever, name your extremely su successful person that's just not available a lot. Uh, me personally, I'm always gonna go for the latter. Um, and I, I think that's, again, we're talking about the extremes, but I think that's a better example of a dad because at least your kids, your family, your community, the world knows that you're contributing to the world. And if you have little ones that look up and see you doing that, what's more inspiring? Is it more important that your kids see that you're actively doing, being the things that is, you know, productive to the world or 100% always available and at home? I, I, I like, I like living on the other extreme. So I'm pretty confident. I know how you answer the question. My answer and ask anyway, right? Yeah. So you have two options. One option is like live like 80 years old, have an average life, you know, sleep eight hours a day, you know, and we like a couple generations down, no one's going to know about you or you live to 50 successful in everything and, and, and plus you don't have to sleep right you, you're never tired right you can be up 24 hours a day doing stuff right yeah and then you, you and you do something to make either you cure cancer or something how you improve humanity you know 20,000 yeah. fold but you die at 50 which one would you pick uh, that's, I'm, I'm down at 50 yeah you know I mean you know it's crazy I'm making this number up but I, I probably like 95 percent of people ask a question to say they want to be 80. why is that they just that's so depressing. Yeah. One thing that they can't the fact that they have to, I said it's not you don't you don't sleep, it's like you're never tired, so you don't need to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't get over that fact, right? And then it's the fact though, well, that's 30 years that I'm not alive, right? But you've lived so many years in those 50, right? 
Like, yeah. That's so many, it is depressing. Like so many people like say, no, I live at 80. I have a question. So is, when they say that, are these conversations that you have on the podcast or just out and about? Everywhere. Just, yeah. Just by pop my head. That's any podcast, like different people, you know. Respectfully, are these uh, like just the normal, the normal human being, like yeah. they do the normal thing? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah we get the, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you, you talk to any high performer, I think they're taking the, the 50 year old, yeah. you know, because I mean, who do we remember more? Um, you know, uh, Chris down the street or Alexander the Great. Yeah. And he died at 32. Yeah. You know, centuries ago, probably more than centuries ago. Yeah. Yeah. And people talk about him even to this day. Yeah. Um, there's, there's something to be said about leaving your mark on the world and getting more done per year that you're alive versus yeah. living five years. Yeah. Um, I agree. But what do I know? I'm, I'm no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a philosopher. I, I don't know. Yeah. So go back to art. Um, what, so you've been to art museums here in Seattle, not too impressed. Have you been to any other art museums in the United States? Yeah, um, all over Texas, um, some in New York, um, Philly, uh, and then one in Florida. I know the names of none of these, by the way. You have a favorite artist? No, I have a favorite piece, though. What one is that? It's of um, Lord... Lord Byron, King of Franks, from um some I think somewhere in the 1600s, it's of him being knighted, um in royalty, um somewhere in Europe. But it's very angelic. He's on his knees in the um I think I believe the Queen uh has a sword out on his shoulder. I don't know what it is, man. I, something about that just appeals to me. I I, I love that kind of stuff. The, the whole thing is beautiful. The whole thing is beautiful. And so you plan, you say you're planning events to like when you get the more means and more, more success, like actually collecting art pieces. 100%. So don't, don't like, I, I hate to use the term rich people, don't use rich people to use that as like a way to build up assets. Yeah, art is an asset class. Yeah, I mean, it's a um, speculative one, but uh, I mean, any financial advisor would tell you that it, it does tend to go up over time. But um, I wouldn't look at it for asset class, to be honest with you. I just like it. Like it, yeah. I just, you know, I just, it's like, like, just like people like shoes and, uh, I'm gonna do the car thing too, but you know, I, art is just one of those things for me. I just love it. I'll be honest. That's one thing I never understood. Like why people collect like thousands of shoes. I just, that's just one thing I just don't get. Yeah. Like, not, not my thing either. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I understand why a flipper would do it Yeah, because like, yeah. you can make money from it, but yeah, I do find it to be one of the dumber things. Yeah. Money. I know those are like a 16 or probably not 16 years old, but it's like 16 year old kid in Florida. He was making like hundreds of thousands of years of flipping shoes, like pro athletes and stuff and some mm -hmm. kind. I mean, they going with like, yeah, it's insane. I wonder if he's still in business with the uh, with the market uh, being the way it is right now. Um, but no, I'm I'm I want to do the art thing so bad that I have it in my vision board. Yeah. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. are you gonna collect like known pieces, or are you gonna like, invest in like you know up and coming artists, so to speak? Whatever. If if that up and coming artist did uh, classical European art, probably get it as long as it's beautiful, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you get your interest in art to start? It's 2015, 2016, somewhere around after I read the book. Well, actually, no, it was before that because something prompted me to read that book. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think I've always had like a, um, propensity to like mature things, mature themes, uh, stuff with, uh, substance. And um in nuance, I've always been that way. Like even when I was really young, I was like talking to older people. Um, I don't know. It art is a funny one, man. Like, how do you really explain that? It, yeah, like you know, you, when, you, when you think it's great, I'm like, what in the world? Like, this is crap, and vice versa, right? You know, like yeah. like some people think Andy Warhol's Camel Soup is like the best thing ever. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't. I don't think anyone genuinely believes that. Yeah, I, I just don't believe that. It, like. I, I I know it was subjective, but I just don't believe it. So here's a story for you. You probably don't know. So you know how they had the Tacoma Dome down in Tacoma? Yeah. Supposedly back in like, I get the dates wrong, like in 1974, 75, maybe early 80s, they want to like actually make it look better. Like they want to like, you know, paint it, right? Mm -hmm. And so they had actually commissioned Andy Warhol. He's going to paint some flowers on it, right? And and they at the last minute, they voted no because they're like, why should we pay Andy Warhol $250,000 for the sunflowers? We have all these poor people, right? Yeah. But now, I don't know, of course, not saying how it would look good or bad or whatever, but now, decades later, you still have like probably more poor people in Tacoma 
you have this like eyesore in Tacoma. That's a big tom- 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 Tacoma dome, right? Yeah, yeah. Tacoma. Um, I will say this about Tacoma. There's a lot of opportunity in Tacoma. Yes, it is. Um, Tacoma is somewhere where, uh, uh, at least for my firm, that we put a lot of focus in. So yes, there there's a lot to be said about Tacoma, but the one thing I like about Tacoma versus Seattle is that, uh, well, I guess you say so, but more so in Tacoma is that there's almost nothing but upside there. Yeah, I think Tacoma has a problem of they're, they're always trying to be like a better Seattle, right? You or, think so? I think so. Hmm. I, I think. What, they, what do you mean? It's like you know, all the time, like you know, we we need to have a tech startup scene in Tacoma, like Seattle. You know, we have oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Like be Tacoma, it's right? Close enough. It yeah, should just be, be Seattle. Be Tacoma. Be your like you know, embrace what you are, right? Your grittiness and your all that kind of stuff. You hit it right on the head. The grittiness. Um, they should just lean into it, in my opinion. Yeah. But listen, I'm, I'm just a cultural critic. I, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman. I, yeah. I don't know. And have you heard this one? Like I said it before. Like you know, it, like in, if you, in Seattle, they think everything south of the airport is in Mexico. <laughs> like if you ever been to Tacoma, like no one from Seattle will ever come, right? Like once the blue moon came, but like everyone to come goes up to Seattle, right? People in Seattle, that's the South Airport. Yeah. I, I need a passport, you know. Of course, yeah. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that, though. Because Tacoma does seem like the boondocks when, when you're like close to Seattle. Yeah, that's so interesting. They even dress different there. Oh yeah, but I like Tacoma. I, I, I just don't live there. Yeah, <laughs> don't, see, a, don't see myself living animal. there either. It's a, it's a different different animal there. One of our bigger clients at uh, Bayside Tacoma, to come and they're doing a lot of good work there. Um, they definitely, uh, and they, they're improving Tacoma one block at a time. It, it's, which is why I say like, I know personally, like yeah. Tacoma has, has nothing but upside. It's interesting to see how that turn, how Tacoma, how Tacoma and Renton turns out in the next 20 years. Yeah. Also, it's to see how Fife continues to build out. Cause like Fife has all these, like, um, what's we call it? The, um, warehouses and stuff you know yeah yeah so uh, you recently moved here from texas right yes how long have you been up here a year and uh i think three or four months now what made you move up here um to be honest with you because my parents moved out here um i'm really close with my parents and after they moved made the move from virginia to to seattle once i got done running track um i wanted to live closer with my parents you good yeah we're good so next um I forgot about you told me before your parents moved up here. And why did they move up here? To be honest with you, no reason. No reason. They um just wanted a fresh start. And they were looking like, where to move to? Mm-hmm. Seattle sounds nice. Okay. Moving to Seattle. It was it was that simple. Yeah. No, no relatives up here, never been here before. No, 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 we do. Um, so we had we had two aunts, uh, two aunts and uncles, and um my younger cousin, my younger cousin Bunny. With whom I um I love her so much, I think the world of her. But um, but no, we we have some family out here though. Hey, let me let me fix it. Yeah, go ahead, fix that. Is there anything I can do to help? No. I gotta get a new table. Do your thing. Well, that should be better now. Let's do it. And so you've been up for about, about less than a year. What yes. kind of opportunities you see in Seattle? Seattle's so interested. Um, what kind of opportunities? I think business is e- easy in Seattle, in, in my opinion. Do you? Yeah. Because you always hear about the Seattle freeze, the Seattle chill, you want to call it, you know, people like don't really that's a real talk thing. to you. No, that's definitely a real thing. Um but as far as, uh, I mean, I work in investment banking. As far as like um, getting access to the clientele, um, sources of capital, and uh, kind of just getting deals done, it, um, I really like Seattle. I also will say this too. I'm a, I'm a Christian, and uh, the Christian community here is very strong. It's very, very strong. And uh, in, in those respects, it, 
I think I think a lot of Seattle in that respect. Now that's not to ignore though the craziness. There is crazy stuff in Seattle. Now I, I found the statement you saying like as a strong Christian community here kind of like interesting because like I saw a stat a while ago where it's like there's more non-Christian beliefs in Seattle than anywhere in the United States. I think that's plausible, but um, it's that reason to why the, the Christian. Now, I mean, listen, I, I I never made the case that it was a big Christian community. Mm-hmm. If there okay. is, I'm not aware of it. Um, and from what I've seen. Uh, again, this isn't data driven, but from what I've seen, um, it is a smaller community, but it's more close knit. It's very tight. Or maybe the cell wasn't like not Chris, but there's more atheists here or agnostic people yeah. versus anything else. Yeah. Um, and some people say because there's so many liberals here, that kind of stuff. And of course, I have no idea. Uh, it, it may correlate. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's causal. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. But um, nah, I mean, listen, if I take a guess, I would assume that there's more atheists than than uh people of faith here but uh for the people who are christian here in, in my experience from what i've seen very tight-knit very uh very giving they look out for one another it's um just really uh re- really really strong and i'm thankful to have met them to be honest so being a christian how does that help drive your values to be like a, a great businessman how's those tying to each other um it, they tie into each other so much that um it's hard to even speak about because it it's it's just the foundation for everything that, you know, as a, as a Christian, I would assume that the ultimate goal um, outside of pleasing God is, is to is to give to the world, give to the world by way of whatever the mission of if you if you own your business, whatever um, the mission of your business is. Um, it's one of the same. You, I mean, you can't do one without the other. It's, uh, you know, we talk about this a lot, too, um, in, in, in the communities, but um no, it's, it's everything. It's, it's foundational. You, it's like breathing. It's, it's, it's everything. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered it, though. It, it, it does. It does. Okay. Um, so next, you know, this last weekend, there's like a, we had two banks that failed, right? Of course, everyone- That we know of. That we know of. That's a great point. Of course, being the tech community, everyone talks about Silicon Valley Bank, but two banks actually failed. And of course, um, can you talk about some, why that happened or your, what your take on that is? Yeah. Um, <laughs> in the most literal sense, it was a classic bank run. Um, I mean, banks by definition, um, they have a um, uh, a duration mismatch between their assets and liabilities. They take in short-term deposits that's supposed to be readily liquid if you wanted to take it out at any time. They take it, uh, keep percentage on hand, and uh, either lend or invest the rest of it out. Um Whenever they are lending, depending on what kind of bank, this is a, a tech-focused uh, bank, so it's more business. Um, so they'll lend out longer than the deposits are supposed to be ready. Um, and there's a mismatch there between the times, between when you loan the money out and when the when you have to have money on hand to be able to give it to people if they want to deposit them or withdraw their money. Um, and then we'll make this situation more interesting, though. For um, SVB, it's the fact that they invested a lot of their money, uh, depositors' money, into long duration uh, treasures. So the thirty year bond. That's where the interest rates came in and stuff, right? Yeah. So they 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 bought them they they bought them back when interest rates were really low. The majority of their bonds. Um, I, I think the average interest rate was around one point five percent, which is um, I mean it's so low it's not even funny. And um, there's an inverse relationship between the interest rate on a, on a on a bond slash treasury. And the price of the of, of that of that bond. So whenever interest rates go up, the price of the bond go down, and vice versa. Um, as you know, interest rates are not one point five as as I talk to you right now. Um, so the the value of the bonds went down, uh, which means they have less money overall, which is fine. I mean, they're technically underwater, but that's still fine as long as um, all your depositors want their money back. But when they had to uh, raise more money to 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 raise more more, more capital uh, for the bank. Um, their biggest, some of their biggest um, uh, people that they bank, you know, took that as a red flag and initiated just a classic bank run. And what's interesting about uh, SVB is that they have like parent VC firms and all their subsidiaries. So if one VC firm, a, a good one, says we're pulling our money. That's that's the parent firm and all the subsidiaries, and now you you magnify this, you know, at a bigger scale. Let's say thirty VC firms say this. That bank is going out of business because it's going to cause a bank run, and they don't have the money. By the way, this could happen to any bank. 
literally any bank. It, banking is all confidence. It's all, it's all confidence. Um, but what made this even more interesting outside of the uh, SVB clientele pulling all their money at once was the fact that for these same bonds that they at the bank had purchased at 1.5, there were no hedges on it. Um, now, there are reasons to why they did not get flagged for doing that. I want to get all the way into the weeds. I know banking is a sexy topic. You know, everyone loves talking about it. But um, it's, it's very unusual for a bank to buy a lot of bonds. Normally, what they would do is hedge. You, they will have hedged their positions in some kind of way, whether it's through uh, either shortening the same bonds that they bought or uh, some kind of derivative or something. There were no hedges there. So when the price of the bond went down, they, they were just losing money, like just hand and fist. That was very unusual. And then, um, but it's, even though that's unusual, it's more unusual for VC firms to pull all their money at once, especially for a bank that did so much to help them. Yeah, especially as something like as big like Peter Thiel, like one of the big VCs in America saying, hey, I'm pulling my money out. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a very big deal. Yeah, and what's scary about it though is that um, that can happen to any bank, a any bank, no, no matter the size. So I don't know if you saw today what was going on with Credit Suisse, but very similar stuff. Similar stuff, yeah. And like I know some people were like you know saying keep your money in the bank, you know, don't take it out, you know, the bank has done so much for us, you know. And other people are like I'm taking my money out, right? Yeah. And like and like and it, to me, we really can't blame the people taking the money out, right? Because it's their money, right? Yeah. And, and like, a lot of them take make payroll. Risk. A lot of people need to make payroll. It's like there's there's the logical thing, and then there's the thing that you would do when you're in the situation. Logic means absolutely nothing when you're going through it. Yeah. If you if you have fears about your bank closing on you, and you have all your money there, which and you, you got to pay be. twenty people in yeah. two days, then you know their families are dependent on it, and the mortgage is dependent on it, right? Like, yeah. It's it's easy to to not be in it and to say you should keep your money there, but again, if you're if you're going through that. I think most people are, are going to attempt this point. Now, does this have any effect on what happened at Silicon Valley Bank? I, I'm making this numbers up, but I think in 2020, they only had like, well, only, quote unquote, only $49 billion, but they failed had like $229 billion. Like, and that happened like two years. That, that a rapid increase of money affected decision-making process, you think, or how they did things? or um, uh, Yes, in a backdoor kind of way. Um, and they, they had, the to be more specific, uh, they went from the 49, roughly, to the two, they were under 250. So I think it was 249, 248 billion assets, which is different than, than, um, core hard cash. Cause if they, if they had, if they had that much money, they'd be fine. They'll still be here today. Um, but yes, when, um, you know, a lot of these big money, I mean, cause banks are the same as hedge funds, private equity, insurance companies, pensions, family. I mean, they're all, they all do the same stuff. They, they, they pull in money, invest it out, pocket the spread, then what they have to pay back to the investors. Um, but when uh, interest rates were so low, they all were chasing yield. So that uh, a lot of, you know, I'm a banker, so I can't, you know, advise or, you know, speak. I can't, I can't say certain things, but a lot of people do make the case, though, that, that um, if that was not the case, then they would not be in a position that they're in right now. Because um, whenever interest rates are lower, you know, commercial banks create uh, the majority of the money in the economy. Um, yeah, whenever they extend credit to you, that's them creating money. And what they're doing is basically banking on the fact, no pun intended, that you're not going to need to pull all that money at the same time. When they when they um extend you ten dollars in credit, they only need to have one one of those dollars like on hand. Um, so banks create money. When interest rates are lower, they're more comfortable creating more money because they have to. They have to chase that yield because with all banks compete. All, all money managers compete on whatever the yield on bonds are. That's like the baseline. They have to at least beat that. So when it's 1%, you have to at least beat 1%. And all this, I'm guessing, like this basic math, basic bank stuff that you're talking about, like <laughs> any regular bank would know this? Yeah, yeah, okay. all of them, all of but them. But most regular Americans would, would probably wouldn't know this, right? Most Americans, uh, we, can, we, can, we can drag this across multiple topics, but most Americans have no idea how banking actually works. So is that like their fault, the schooling system's fault? Is that something like, like a dad should be teaching a kid? Like I think how so. finance works, you know? I think so. Um, and I also think that if you're going to school for finance or you take a finance class, even in high school, they should do a better job of teaching it. I think, I think it's both, to be okay. honest. So of course, like we talked, two banks actually failed. Silicon Valley Bank got most of those press because you know because tech semi semi valley you know tech stuff. Yeah. 
but the other bank is PLJ, pretty much for the same reasons or exact same reasons. And what do you know? What's the name of the other bank? Do you know? Signature. Signature yeah. in New York. New York, okay. Yeah. That's just like a regular commercial bank. Yes. They okay. they're a really big player in the real estate market in New York. Okay. So th there's more implications on that one too. I mean, it's I mean, new, real estate in New York, that, that's their biggest asset class. Uh yes, yeah, scary. And so you were talking pre talk about how like uh, I was saying, like how like, you know, ignorant some people are, right? On Twitter, I had some people on Twitter like well, who cares about those tech people? You know, they deserve to lose the money, or like, yeah. or like, you know, you, you're guaranteed two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's more enough to pay your payroll. Or one person put like, and you have to wonder sometimes: uh, is that a real person? Is a bot doing this, right? Because oh well, there are a lot of bots. So, yeah, you know, it, I'm sure some people said that one person said like, in order to have a small business or tech company, you have to be a millionaire anyway. So that's this insane. Goes to, this is on the personal fact, savings. Jason, is that true? No, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. And no, Right. No, it's it's insane. I mean, listen, I'm I'm no um pro Fed guy. I'm not I, I don't I don't fall in that camp, but um it's insane to almost laugh at someone for not being able to access the money in their in their bank account. Cause again, this can literally happen at any bank in the world. If everyone wanted to pull their money like that, they're done for. That's banking. There's no way around that. Yeah. So um What's your, what, what was your take on this? So of course, you know, they're not calling it a bailout or whatever, you know, say text her to a back. It's, no, it's back. a bailout. It, it's a bailout. Do you think the government should have did what they did and back, back these back up or should they just let them fail let the uh, free market economy take, take, take control? Um, I literally can't say what I think they should have done. But um, I will say this, and, you know, you, 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 you'll understand what I'm getting at. Um, if they did not do that and they let them fail and everyone involved, and they take that approach just across the board, no matter how dire those consequences are. And I mean, these, it can get dire, like to the point where you drag down an entire country. But if they took the approach of just not touching anything, um, it would, just like with anything, teach the um, participants to be more disciplined in how they're behaving, you know, in the game, uh, so to speak. Um, but I, I can't say what, I, you know. So do you think, I, I, I'm pretty sure that most Americans don't realize how close we came, like they being like really some bad stuff going on, right? I think most Irish Americans are like, oh, we just paid these billionaires some money. I don't think I have any clue, like how, I won't say collapse. By the way, there's truth to that. There's truth to that. I mean, there has been over, uh, I want to say 500 banks that has failed since 08. And you, you don't, you never hear anything about it. Um, I had no idea about that. Yeah, yeah. Banks fail every year. I mean, it's. It's not uncommon for a bank to fail. It's, it's hard running a bank. It's a hard thing to do. Um, managing that kind of risk, you know, it's, it's a balancing act, essentially. Imagine, imagine like, suppose you have, like, a, a bank with $100 million and probably, like, maybe two or three men have, put, like, had the majority of money. Like, you know, man, I hope, hope, you know, James Brown doesn't take out his $25 million tomorrow because he gets mad at us, right? Well, if you're a bank that has $100 million in assets, you don't have a client that has $25 million okay. at all. You, you, you deal with... Um, um retail clients like okay traditional mom and pops that probably don't have more than five grand in in their account at any given time um if because let I me mean, think about it if, if you if you are a hundred million i think that'd be considered a micro bank if you have a hundred million dollar if you have a hundred million dollar bank you um you have a client that has 25 million dollars that's 25 percent of your entire that's book. too big of a risk way too big okay yeah um that's insanity <laughs> that that's um they wouldn't even be able to take on that, that deposit. It's too big. You, so, so one thing that um, most people don't realize is, is that there are different categories of banks as far as like their sizes and the um, type of products that they operate in. Most people think banks are just what, you know, the branch that they walk into, they don't think it's any different. They don't know what happens in the back end of it. They just know, oh, um, I put my money here. I may need a credit card sometime. But um, it's so much... The world of finance, specifically banking, is is like the matrix. It's uh, it's so nuanced. There's so many different players that do so many different things, specialize in different areas, you know, geographies, everything. And um, I think the world is starting to wake up to that now, because Silicon Valley was. I mean, that's a perfect example. They were under 250 billion in assets, um, and they catered to. Uh, they they were they had a concentrated book as far as the type of clients that they serve, and um, concentration in banking is is one of the worst things you can do. Because when things go bad, it gets uh, horrific. Yeah, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm pretty sure it is. Like, suppose like a lot of VCs in, in, in the, the Bay Area, where they gave you company money, 
you had to agree to put your money into Silicon Valley Bank. I do know some VC firms that do do that. Yeah, which um, one could argue is a conflict of interest. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, I would think. But what do I know? <laughs> I'm not suggesting it though, but you know, one could make that case. Yeah. So next, let's talk about the Federal Reserve. Oh boy. And I, I could be wrong. But I think most average Americans think the Federal Reserve is belongs to the federal government, right? But isn't it actually like a private bank? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a private bank owned by 12 regional banks um, spread out across the country. So how, how did the Federal Reserve thing come about? Like just have people more confidence or like, what do you think? Um, if I had to summarize it like really quickly, yes, it's, it's there to instill confidence. Um, and they enact their confidence um, with essentially emergency credit facilities for banks um, and by influencing the front in of um, front end of the curve. So, so primarily short dated um, interest rates. And the Federal Reserve Chairman, he he's over those banks, right? I'm gonna get that wrong. Uh, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, he's the chair. I mean, you can word it that way. Okay. I mean, most people colloquially know it. But he does that. He's not appointed by the President of the United States. It's like some he's, he's voted in. Voted but, in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, he, I don't think people realize how powerful that person is. Okay. I, I think people know. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, they're, they're, I think they're you, can, to know. you can say that he's more powerful than the president of the United States. Yeah. Um, but you can also say that um, Jamie Dimon is more powerful than the president of the United States. Um, yeah, these finance people, man, because I mean, these are multinational corporations. Uh, we, moving off the Federal Reserve, but like, um, like the Jamie Dimons and Larry Finks of the world, they, they have branches um, or headquarters rather all over the world. Um, and I mean, I think JP Morgan specifically, I want to say they have somewhere around uh, 9 million in assets, somewhere around there, I think. Um, that's such an inconceivable, uh, um, inconceivable amount of money that people, they can't really wrap their head around that. Yeah. And to, to, to have that kind of weight is... Um, it's kind of frightening. Yeah, I think Joe Rogan said one time famously that, you know, he has fuck you money. These people have like 20 times, 20 times to the X power fuck you money, I think, you know. It's um, it's so far past fuck you money. It's, it's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. Now, they would say, you know, this is our client's money. It's not our money. You know, we're just, you know, prudent brokers or whatever. Um. Let's be real. They're, they're the ones making decisions on, on where, how to deploy the capital. Is their money? Yeah. So, what's your? Do you have any take on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? How's it affect future finances or like anything like that? No, not really. No. Um. I don't. You know. Don't really deal with that that much. Well, it's not a need of my clients. Mm -hmm. Um. It's it's more of a thing. I, I'll talk about it on Discord with some of my friends, but I, it's not um. I deal with hardcore banking and finance. Uh, Bitcoin, I wouldn't consider hardcore banking okay. or finance uh, until it's um, it is known or used as a consistent medium of exchange. It has literally nothing to do with my day to day business. Okay. Uh, what do you think about it though? I, I think it's interesting. So I would pay attention to the first time I really paid attention to it when when my barber told me he accepted Bitcoin as payment, right? Uh -huh. They're like, oh shit, this might be in mainstream with my barber, you yeah. know, accepting it, right? 100%. Yeah, I think people like interested in, you know, like decentralized, all that kind of stuff, you know. I think it's an interesting concept, but like, I don't know, like, is anyone gonna really go away from the American dollar? I mean, I don't know. Uh, listen, I'll, I'll say this. Um, the US dollar is the, the world reserve currency. It may not be for longer, but but it is. And um, I have a question. What incentive does literally any country in the world have for uh to promote bitcoin as their primary currency i mean countries literally over the history of the world has gone over war they, they've gone to war over what currency is going to be used yeah. if you think that um i'm not saying that bitcoin won't be used as a primary currency i'm not saying that but if you think it's just going to be like smooth sailing yeah. and, you know countries just just going to let that happen yeah. um you're insane I know the president of South Dog Salvador went to Bitcoin. Of course, these, all the politics were against him and stuff, you know. Yeah. So I have no idea how that's going. But those holdings are also underwater too. Yeah. He bought it at. He, I mean, it was a classic. You know, buy it at the height and <laughs> take substantial. That was imprudent on his part, by the way, if I may, in in my opinion. Um, if I was his banker, I wouldn't uh, advise him to have done that. Yeah. So. How did you come so interested in finance? Was it your degree or no? It, um. I actually did the antithesis of what most people do. 
I did not even bother with it in school. I did my own schooling. I just bought as many books as I can um, and just read it. Now, I, I got lucky to kind of circle back to our earlier conversations. I have no issue like maxing out, going all in on like a, something I'm interested in. And by that, I mean like uh, buying the most arcane um, scholarly um, like textbooks on it, reading it front to back and just being completely enamored in it. It's fascinating to me. I love the flow of money. Like the idea of taking money and guaranteeing uh, um, to pay back to whoever gave it to you over a certain period of time and then reinvested it for um, and, and then pocketing the spread. It, that's just fascinating to me. It, I don't know why. It's, it's very interesting. And they do it across all forms of finance. They do it in banking, insurance, um, private equity, hedge funds, all of it. It's the same. It's the same thing, just different time durations. Do you have any like finance mentor, so to speak? No, no, no. Well, I guess over the internet, but like I, I have sources that like I have podcasts I listen to, you know. But um, no, I never, no. What mistakes do you think people make when they get into finance? When they get into it, yeah. Uh oh, not thinking big enough. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they get it. If I mean, I I have clients today that has worked at the biggest banks in the world doing the same thing that I'm doing right now. And um, I'll ask them, why are you even working with me? Why, why don't you, you know, I'm like, I'm younger than you. I've been doing as long as you, why don't you just do X, Y, Z, but, but they think big enough and they're scared. And uh, I think that's the number one, I think it's the number one thing across any industry, uh, across, too, yeah. across anything, actually, even too in sports. Have, have self, what's called self-limiting beliefs? Uh, I hate it and I love it at the same time because it's it's so frustrating to see, but it helps me out because I'm not scared. I'll do what yeah. you're scared to do. I'm right. This must be more frustrating to see someone like, man, you used to be like 20 times better than me. You have a potential like, and you're like, I, I hate to say like, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Because maybe they're happy with it or whatever, but still like. Are they though? They might think they are. So let's circle back. Yeah. They're the guy that's on the couch doing the thing every day. Yeah. Are they happy? I don't think so. I think they're miserable. I think they hate yourself. I think they, I think they hate their life. I really do. Um, because, you know, you, you, I mean, we're really touching on themes here, but they are probably in a relationship they're not happy with. Yeah. Um, they're, they're always thinking, you know, what if, you know, what, what if I done that, made that decision or, you know, did this career path or whatever. I, I, I don't think they're happy people. I think they do the regular thing and they're miserable. You make a good point. I think people like realize like how your life is decision points, right? Like, 100%. If you like done this or maybe done that, or maybe like, you know, maybe if someone left the house a couple of minutes earlier, they would have ran into you mm -hmm. and you've been a couple of life, right? Or just, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much like no, no one realized all these decision points, you know, very good or bad, you know? Yeah. That, um, that butterfly effect. Yes, that butterfly it, effect. Yeah. yeah it's, it's real. It's real to the point. I mean, you can get lost in that rabbit hole to the point where i'll just zero it out at you know what all you can do is make good decisions moving forward yeah because you you, you can you can you can do the what if game yeah to affinity <laughs> i mean well i, I think i read somewhere some of the odds of you even being alive like one to a trillion right i think gary v says that yes, Gary um, yeah and that's, that's, probably is that's an awesome way of looking at the world too yeah. it, it really puts everything in perspective uh yeah i I like approaching things that way even though i have to remind myself to do it even like yeah. even today i did it's like it's kind of strange how you like you want to People want to think they're special, you know, so you, that way you got to be more confident, do more great things. But then again, you got to think, you know, like you're this tiny speck, this tiny rock and a million of billion other rocks, you know, like. Yeah, so to, absolutely. And to that same point, um, are you into astrology? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, actually, I'm not. I mean, I know Sagittarius, you know, I'm more like, like space stuff. Excuse me. Stuff. Excuse me. Astronomy. Astronomy, excuse, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I've been I've been talking to too many people. <laughs> um, but no, to that point, people don't realize how massive. Um, um the actual world is outside of yeah like outside I, of Earth. I, I think i saw a picture of the james Webb telescope like every day they're um finding like hundreds more galaxies hundreds more planets or probably a thousand more right yeah like, i know you seen the picture like all these little dots it was yes. like each one's a galaxy each one's like blah 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 yeah like, yeah it's the, the insane. there are more um universes than um there's grains of sand yeah um on, on earth it's um it's it's mind-boggling I, I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. And we're then, dealing with numbers that's so, that, that are so yeah. just large that 
I don't think it's humanly possible for us to really wrap our heads around it. Yeah, and uh, you know, of course, one side of people say like the, we're the only people, you know, we're the only test of life. Insanity. Yeah, but the thing is, like, there's like they, they've proven there's like been life on Mars, different places. But of course, like the what's that little bacteria stuff. Yeah, but I think the odd. I mean, you think a lot of speaking, it has to be life somewhere else, right? I mean, like maybe it's not just like us or like this, Whoa. and maybe look, they maybe look like jellyfish or something like we can't even conceive, you know, or very likely we don't even understand all the life forms on Earth. No, like so many like stuff in the oceans, we have no idea what it is, right? Exactly. I mean, we don't even know all of human history. Let's just be no. honest. Um, so, yeah. I remember at Texas walking into a class. I hate school, by the way. I'm just throw it out there. I, I fought with my teachers. I did all this stuff. Um, I remember walking into a class for astronomy, and first day, um, the TA, not even a teacher, some some guy took himself more serious than he was. He's one of us actually. He's actually a student, but a TA was um someone asked him, was there other forms of life outside of us? Like on out, uh, um were, were there forms of life on other planets outside? Of earth and he like just laughed he's very posh about it very condescended i, I just walked out yeah because i'm like if, if if you don't even entertain the thought because you know so much right because you're a genius it, it, why am i why are you teaching me what what is there that you can teach me yeah. um this is a waste of time I, i'm out of here i want to i want to run track and do business stuff anyway this is yeah. stupid and the thing is like you know like how much stuff do you not know right now right like if you go, majority of things. If you go back thirty years ago, no, there was no, no, or maybe hundred years. Like most people didn't have electricity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, no cell phones, no space travel. Like yeah. And so I don't know if you know this, but um, I think it was your eighteen ninety four, eighteen ninety five, like eighteen eight, like at that time period, the US, U.S. Patent Office was actually wanted to try to close down because the head of the head, person head head charter said like everything's been discovered. There's no need for it anymore. <laughs> That's funny. That's that's um that's like up there with like um you know they pull out these quotes from like Steve Ballmer or yeah. whoever and they'll be like they they doubted uh an invention that that went on to do really well. Yeah. Whenever you take a snapshot in history like that, you're bound to find someone to say something stupid. But no, it 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 definitely the hubris of of uh, humans to to think uh, that we know so much. It's um again insanity. What's a future invention that you hope gets gets done? Uh, I'm interested to see uh, the future of chat GPT. Okay. Um, cause the implications of it is, is, uh, uh, I think it's the most important, um, invention in our lifetime outside of the internet itself. I do think so. I don't know much about it, but like, you know, I heard like you can go there, like pretty much ask any information and get it. So if that's the case, why even go to school anymore? Right? Like, what's well, the point? um, cause it's a tool. Um, well, it should make school more thoughtful now. So the days of doing like mundane stuff just because I think are over. Um, it, it, it's it's the equivalent of like, um, I mean, you definitely know going to school and like using a calculator and getting in trouble for it. And it's like, where am I ever going to be in, in life in which I won't have access to a calculator? Um, it doesn't make math not important though. You, you still have to know like how to use the tool of a calculator and how to apply it, um, how to put it into context, um, et cetera. Same thing for uh, with ChatGPT. It's a, um, a researcher's dream. I mean, I, I, the way my brain works, I, I just take in a lot of information. Um, every, every night I'm researching more stuff in the industry. And um, I, I mean, it's, it's just perfect, man. You can just ask it something very specific, very, 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 very specific. Um, ask it to give you the sources, examples, um, put into a certain context, and then give you both sides of it. And it'll, it'll spit it out within seconds. That's um, that's incredible. Um, but yeah, the days of, of like just having the days of regurgitation are over. Thank God, because that doesn't you can regurgitate something. We know people who got straight A's because they can regurgitate yeah. and were abject idiots. Yeah, they just couldn't. Um, they could you know tell you the the perfect dimensions of a square but couldn't tell you like how to put that in yeah. the proper context of a subject. I just hope the people in charge of schools realize this, you know, they're actually like changing the time, so to speak, you know, like change the, curric the, um, the curriculum and stuff, you know, updated. I think they're going. going to point and complain and cry. Academia, I really hate it. I, I can't stand it. I really don't like school. It's it's more show than like substance. All the, um, the genuine thinkers get pushed out. If you are um, original in any aspect, school is just not for you. And then, uh, I mean, me personally, I'm so biased in this, by the way. 
yeah. But I mean, me personally being in class and like just having to play these stupid games with professors with these ego complexes. Um, I I just never it always blew my mind that they'll put that like the you know the look of things yeah. over the actual substance of what, and that's assuming that we're talking about a hard science. We're not going to touch on liberal arts. Yeah. Philosophy, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh no. It's, it's all politics at that point. It's all, do I agree with your opinion? If not, you'll, you'll magically find yourself in the I, lower percentile. I'll, I'll be a communist for a semester, get your A uh, or whatever the case may be. To that point, the, the amount of people in schools who are pro communist is uh, actually scary. The amount of people in Seattle is a pro comments is kind of scary too. There, I won't say the guy's name, but um, I was talking to him uh, sometime last year and uh, about six months ago, and he just said it casually. He's like, "Yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a communist. I, you know, I believe in these principles." And I was just looking at him like, and "He probably owns a business." Of course he does. No, it's uh, of course he does. <laughs> um, it's um, it's interesting, you know. So being in a position you know, that not as in like in a high position, but being able to talk to so many different business owners. I mean, that's what I do every day. And um, I just keep my opinions to myself. It, it's not my job to give them like world opinions. We, we It's my job to give them um, opinions on a financial transaction, uh, a non-security one, but like, you know, how should we structure this deal? Yeah. So and sometimes it's hard, especially dealing with different personalities. But uh, yeah, the, the, there are communists here. I see. I've never seen this in Texas, by the way. I, I've only seen it in Seattle. Exactly. Um, so we're gonna come back to your come your bank and stuff in a minute. But next, I want to switch to the Olympics, right? Oh yeah. So I'm gonna play a video for you. Oh God. Hope this thing works. You about to blind side? Oh. oh so. Yeah, yeah. So this is when the Olympic trials. Yeah. I just want you to like comment through the race, like what you if you can remember what you're thinking about during those time period, like yes. Actually, let me first say. Okay. Um, lane eight, Jeshua, he's a coach at uh, University of Washington right now. Okay. We've never talked until I think two months ago. Great guy. Um, he's a men's head track coach there or, um, I think he's a sprint coach there. Okay. Um, I should put you two in contact with each other. He's, he's really awesome. Um, lane seven, Karan Clement. Um, he's one of the greatest athletes ever. Great, great guy as well. Um, just as he was starting to like, like be a mentor to me because we didn't go to the same school. He went to Florida. I went to Texas. Um, just as he was starting to become a mentor to me, I retired. So we ended up okay. actually retired around the same time. Okay. Because he's, he's older. He's uh like somewhere around 10 years older. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, lane six, Michael Tinsley. He was in my training group, um, pr- my professional training group. Um, really good guy. Um, he's awesome. Johnny Dutch, crybaby. We don't have to talk about him. He's, he's a crybaby. Um, Ricky, I don't know him that well, but, um, like we, we've talked in passing and, um, he seems like a really good dude. I don't, I don't think he runs anymore. Quincy stills run. Um, yeah, he still runs. He went to LSU and, um, crazy for him, crazy, crazy for him. Like, it's all over the place, but, uh, that's Quincy though. He's a, he's a really good, well-rounded athlete. He can run everything up to the eight. Uh, lane two is the most handsome guy in the race. <laughs> and Bershawn was my idol as I'm up in track because okay. we were, uh, similar heights. We had the same running style as far as how we how we ran the race, and um, he's one of the most um, giving people, um, as like as his character, and he he is one of the um, most impressive track athletes like ever. And if I did my research right, you're the you're actually only the only college person in this finals, right? Correct. Yeah. I, so I, I think, and again, I think most Americans think Olympics, college, like amateurs, but track is actually mostly pros, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Track is interesting because even if you have, if you look at a pro time and a collegiate time, these may be the same times, but to do it as a pro is so much harder. It's it's so much harder that like, it's not even funny. It's, it, it's almost, almost like looking at times. It's so much harder. Yeah. Um, so off, sub, off topic, right? Just pop my head. So Tyreek Hill recently ran like some kind of master's race, right? Yeah, 60. Yeah. It was crazy. Like you had like the like regular people like, oh my God, he won this, you know, the race that haven't ran track in nine years. Then I see some track people on, like, dude, like he wouldn't, he wouldn't even like um, uh, make it to the finals in college at that time, right? He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have made it to the meet. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And did you ever watch the Pat McAfee show? I'm familiar with it. So it was so funny, right? They did one episode, right? Man, I can't believe Tyreek Hill ran so fast. And the next <laughs> day he like, 
I got to correct myself, right? Like, I don't know what's going on here, but like, let's look at these other runners, right? Like, what is it? Dude, what is this dude running? Like, he's running sideways, right? This dude running straight up. Like, who are these jokers running a target kill, right? Yeah. It was like so funny how, like, man, I, I, I got to change my mind, right? First, I thought target kill, like, it's a badass, right? Well, non track people have to, um, we just have to focus on time. So let's, let's just take our opinions out of it. What are the t- that's what I love about track. It, what is the time? Yeah. What, what is the time and what was the win? And then that just tell you everything. Um, but no, I mean, listen, for someone to even step out that doesn't have to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, six, seven, it's, that's like he's like slow walking anything either. Like it's pretty, it's still pretty fast, right? I mean, maybe not track, track fast, but like. For a football player, it's incredibly fast. What was it saying? Like, did you see that jump he did? To me, that, that was insane, that jump he did before he started. Oh, 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 oh. When, uh, like uh, get into blocks? Yeah, how hard he got. Yeah. No, he he's an um, impressive athlete, just not track athlete. Yeah. <laughs> it is showed in the time. But no, it, it takes heart to even show up, though, because no one else is going to do that. No. It, but um, let's not get it twisted. He can't stick with a, yeah. a track sprinter. So you ran the 400 meter hurdles. Is that the, that's the same thing Greg Foster ran, right? Greg Foster? Yeah. Who's Greg Foster? He, he's like a limp back in the 80s. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, like I'm sorry, he, Greg. Like, yeah, like he recently died. Oh, wow. Yeah, I thought he ran Rest the 400 meter hurdles too, yeah. He may have. Yeah. Uh, if he did, I'm not aware of him. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'm going to look into him afterwards, though. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe he ran something else. Oh, I, I remember him and, and Edwin Moses ran it too, right? Edwin's a really great guy. He, yeah. he was there. Was okay? Uh, yeah, after, after I had um finished running, I, I met him. That he won like some like 10 million races in a row, right? Then he said like that, didn't he? It was like it was like nine years, nine yeah. months, and nine days. Yeah. 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 He um I, I you know, I'm not I'm not getting to the GOAT conversation, but um, but no, that's um I don't think anyone will ever touch that. I, I that's mean, incredible. I, I definitely thought track it is he definitely has to be in the conversation. I mean in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but to be honest with you, I really don't I don't talk track that much. Yeah. Um I'd be forgetting I even ran track. Yeah. I'm I'm more excited about what I do now than I ever was with anything with track. All right. So having said that, I'm playing this video of your Olympic trial. Can you just like go maybe go use hard process like we were thinking each run, like you know, like other kind of stuff? Yeah, but I I, I can save you the time because I wasn't thinking. You weren't? No, I just blacked out. I don't I don't remember the race. You know? Mm-mm. Okay. I'm gonna play it anyway. Let's do it. So one thing the audience I set up right from here. Okay. Go. Yeah, um, I don't really engage in this a lot, but Johnny Dutch really is a crybaby. Is he? Yeah, he um. Is he still running track? What you say? He says he still run. I don't think so. Okay. But he was making excuses after the race, and I was just like, so, uh, so, I was saying this thing where like they're comparing uh Jason Owens to like, Usain Bolt, and it's like you did the time right. Usain Bolt was like fourteen strides ahead. Mm-hmm. They say if you factor in technology. Like the running surfaces that he would only be like one step behind. Same That's point. not true. That's not true. Oh. No, no. Okay. He would he been substantially further ahead than one step. Okay. And people running that they have all have different forms. You're not like one form to do. Well, you couldn't have the same form even if we wanted to because everybody's body's, body's different. different. Okay. Yeah. Like so, it's like technique. that's the same, or like you just get over the best you can. We go for a certain technique, but some t- when when this race, when you get after the hurdle five, you just need, you just want to make it home. And so this, at this point, uh, I do know that um, the way I ran my race, I was slow down in the back end. So if you notice, everyone's in front of me. Yeah. Okay, you would actually fail to go to the Olympics, right? Nope, not at all. Okay. Yeah, and then from here, I just blacked out. And when you ran, you, you kind of pay attention to what people do on the side of the side. You just totally focus on your lane and taking care of what you can take care of. In, in this race, yeah. I would just focus on myself. Okay. To, to be completely honest with you. Oh, man. Man, and you, you pretty probably just like, what, zero, zero point seconds ahead of somebody else? Like, it was very close. Well, uh, with Mike, Michael Tinsley, the... Um, who with whom I um trained with professionally afterwards. But no, that was um man. I did that. So next I'm gonna play this thing you said just right after you did your um well personally I forgot about this. I 
You trying to make me cry. So talk about that speech you did. I mean, like, was that right after the race? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was just like, I'm pretty sure you rehearsed it. This word also I spoke it was on your mind, right? That wasn't rehearsed. Yeah. No, 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 there was nothing rehearsed about it. Um, no, just talking about, no, you said I still live your life that way, right? Just 100%. You need to start right and you yeah. take advantage of it. 100%. Um, yeah. So, all right. I'm a, uh, I give an exterior, like, of, 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 of someone who's very stoic. I'm very emotional in a sense. I'm very passionate. Everything that I do and say, I, I put all of my weight behind it. Um, so to the first part, everything that I do up to that point in my life, that's all that I wanted to do. I sacrificed everything for it. I mean, everything. Ever since I was, um, I would say around uh, 13 or 14, and I did that at 21. Um, when I say I sacrificed everything, that means no parties, none of the stuff that people my age ever did, didn't do any of it. Um, gave up on a lot of friendships, slept on a lot of couches, had to uh, get rides nonstop buses for hard training days and i mean training days in which like you can't even stand up afterwards um and then bus back and you know just continuously um you're still doing school you know all that kind of stuff exactly so you still gotta be a son you know you still gotta do party party chores around the house and exactly that stuff and up until that so like literally a week out before that i mean i was in college and um i had like 50 dollars to my name $50. That was it. $50. And I ran out of a uh, of protein um, that I would take after training. And I remember like going to the GNC, walking to the GNC, it was, you know, because I didn't have a car. And um buying the protein, I think it was $28.99. Uh it was GNC brand. And I remember thinking, like, this is it. You know, between this and the groceries that I have, because the school was paying um for my trip, you know, I was thinking. If I don't, you know, if if I don't make it happen at this meet, I'm falling back on nothing. There's nothing to fall back on. This is it. Um, and, and it's just like a lot of small stories like that, um, of equal, you know, um intensity that that it takes to be able to do something like that, which is why I don't even like having a conversation with people. Like we were I had a conversation with a client maybe uh, about two months ago. It was an onboarding talk, and he was a big sports guy, and he had, like, very opinionated takes on different athletes, but he never did, like, a sport, really. And if he did, it wasn't at a high level. I'm not that guy. I could never be that guy because I know that if you are on TV or you win anything, it takes so much that you don't even see to even, yeah. even get to that point. Not to say – we're not even addressing, like, doing it well. Even to get there, it takes a lot. Um, and because I, I lived it, I don't – you never hear me really bash an athlete. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have a bad performance, but I'm yeah. not going to attack someone's character just because of something like that. But um, but no, in, in that in that interview, that that was um, I do live my I, I live that way still to this day, 100. Yeah. percent You ever see that? It's a long time ago. This this uh, TV commercial where like Payne Manning was playing quarterback, and this guy was like, "Yo, Payne, you suck. You can't do this. You can't do that." And the next day, Payne showed up at his job. What are these numbers? You, you, you're the worst accountant in the history of the world, right? Like, you know, like people don't realize like you criticize these athletes, but no one comes to your job and tell you, I'm just you suck either, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It's it's a privilege to be honest with you to be in a position to where you have a lot of people. Oh, by the way, we didn't touch on at the actual Olympics, but I didn't make the um final the cameraman had the, the camera in my face. I told him get the fuck out of <laughs> I told him get the fuck out of my face. And I remember uh getting on Instagram afterwards yeah. and I was told I wasn't American and uh, you know all the stuff. It, the peanut gallery was was yeah. having their way. But it, it's a privilege to be in that position though. Cause if you think about it, if if you're talking to a stranger that way and you're just spewing all this stuff, yeah. your life must suck. Yeah. Cause I can tell you right now, I am much more I am in a much better position today than I, I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And I would never talk to like a peer that way. Yeah. No. Even if they did something egregious, I wouldn't. I don't pile you, winners don't pile on, you know, you just don't do that. Yeah. That's that's some lo that's loser behavior. Yeah. That's what unsuccessful people do. Yeah. Um, even if I see someone, even if I don't know them, if it's a regular person on the street and I see them fall or do something that's they that they think is embarrassing, I would help them up. I'm not gonna pile on. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that's what losers do. Here's one for you. So does it go down the Olympic Village like people say it goes down the Olympic Village? To be honest with you, uh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. When, when I was there, I was I was in my room. I was train. I, I'll go train. Yeah. I'll go eat and come back. I, 
I mean, yeah, I mean, you would see the the pals, the um, they, I mean, they, they were handing out condoms about hundreds, um, but um, I didn't, I didn't do any of it. Okay, I, I didn't do anything. Was the Olympic experience like a good experience for you? Of course. Okay. I mean, it was. I mean, it's better to watch it in the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, it's a track meet at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, there's all the shows. I mean, shows all the cameras and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, it's still a track meet. What was it like the uh, um, like walking in the, the opening ceremonies? Um, I mean, that was insane. I'll be listen. You're not gonna believe me. The so for me, I've always wanted to do what I'm doing right now. Like as I talk to you right now, I always wanted to be like a business owner doing something in the investment space. That was cool, but because I sacrificed so much to get to that point. When I actually got there, I thought it would be more to the point where I'm not going to say I didn't appreciate it, but I appreciate the journey more yeah. than the actual Olympics. I have an Olympic, you know, I have the rings, but I really don't think about track anymore. I really don't. That's a part of your past life or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so like focused on our different lines of business now or different markets we want to get into, or now I'm starting to think about how I want to set up my future family. Um, I just, I don't think about old stuff to be honest with you, right. and it wasn't that long ago either. Yeah. Just so much stuff has happened now since then, but especially like today, I I, I just don't spend a lot of time thinking about it to be honest with you. So, My, just, so just a few more questions about track. Mm -hmm. First one is like, like do you decide you were in the front of your hurdles Olympics? I'm like, how we back track? Like, so I saw you were in 600 meters of the races, you know, relays. Like, who? Like, did you say, hey, I want to focus on the front of your Olympics? I think that's the best thing for me. Or does the coach say? I think you better do 600 meters. Like, how does that work? Um, kind of a combination. But, I mean, you, even to get to the Olympic trials, you have to run a time to qualify. But, I mean, if, we, if we're talking, like, beginning of the season, how the strategy is like, um, yeah, I mean, but you should know what what event. You only see that kind of conversation, really, if you're, like, a, a one-two guy okay. or a long jumper slash 100 guy. Sometimes in in uh, not sometimes a lot of times in in uh, longer distances too. If you're a five guy or a ten guy or, or whatever, but um for me personally, I mean I, I, I already knew that I was gonna be a four hundred hurdler. Okay. So all those other races were either for training or for the team because at that time I was in I was in college. So I had to run a six hundred and four by fours and two hundreds like a conference for points for the team. And you turned pro after you graduated from college, right? Yeah. Uh, um. Well, yeah. Pretty much. And I know there's a lot of pro races in Europe. Are there any like pro track teams or any, what is it called, pro something in the United States? All pretty much all in Europe. No, they, they have clubs here, but they're not real teams. Though. Okay. They, they're really just um, a bunch of professional athletes that will get together under one coach and it will train together and they'll call it a club. But I mean, you don't make your money from being on the club, making money from getting a shoe deal and or um, uh, running at, at meets, traveling to meets and running. It's, it's track is really a sales job, to be honest with you. It's 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 a physical sales job. Now I could be wrong, but I, is it sounds like track and feels like way more popular in Europe versus the United States. One hundred percent. Why do you think that is? Any idea? Uh, I think just culturally they just okay. care more, and I think there's also less competition. I believe because uh, outside of uh, soccer, uh, depending on what part of the world we're talking about, um, it's just less competition because um, we have NFL. NBA, baseball, you know, I mean, how can you compete with that? That's, that's a lot. I don't, I don't think you get that like in Switzerland. No. Don't get me wrong. They have their, like their niches yeah. of different sports, but out, outside of uh, football, they don't really have anything. Yeah. And, and that's where athletics will come in. So you're in college. There was no such thing as name, meaningful, as name, name, meaningful likeness, right? The NIL deals. No, nah, no, nah, that wasn't a thing. So how do you think that's, that's affecting college athletes now? I personally, I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I, th I think some people don't agree with that, which you take on that. Do you uh, think your life would be easier? Like, suppose you, you, you sign a, a, an ideal with, I don't know, some taco restaurant in Austin, Texas, right? And give you 5000 a month. Do you think that would decrease your drive? Me? Yeah. No. No. For an average college person? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, because I, I did it professionally. I was in the 1%. The 1% of the 1%. Um, but I wouldn't... I, I wouldn't make a decision off of off of that for the average. I mean, but I mean, most college athletes are not going to do it professionally anyway. Yeah. Um, most don't, yeah. Most athletes don't realize that, you know, like what's the chart? 
you know, for every high school athlete, maybe 0.01% will make it pro some kind of way. Yeah. And if you do make a pro, like NFL is like, what, average of five years, you know, so. No, nah, not even five years, three, three. Well, I think it's two and a half. I, th I think it's yeah. two and a half. Um, but no, I listen, if <laughs> whether they should get paid or not, I'm mean, no, I, I don't, I don't even get into that, that conversation really, but, um, they, um, I don't think it's going to motivate them more now. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, these are, these are college kids. Yeah. What would you have done <laughs> at, at 20 or 19 yeah, or eight? Point. No, at 18 yeah. actually. And you get paid five grand. Yeah. Or like 15 grand. I say 15 grand. You've well, never seen that much money in your life. Oh, that dude from California quarterback, he had signed a $30 million deal with Florida. And then they, they said, no, we can't do that. You know, like dude hasn't done nothing in college, like getting $13 million, you know, like. Well, I'm a free market capitalist. I, I have, if you, if, if, if you demand that from the market and the market agrees, yeah. do you think, yeah. um, is it good for that individual, uh, young person? You know, we 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 can we can we can go back and forth about yeah. it. I think on a net basis, no. Yeah. I, I don't think it. I don't think it moves them closer to if assuming they want to be a pro. Yeah. I don't think it moves them closer to being a pro. Yeah. No. Can you imagine if NIL was along back right from Deion Sanders in college or Bo Jackson was in college or the boss was in college, right? How much money they would have made? Let's not get it twisted. Athletes are, have always been getting paid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. But um, they would have been paid handsomely, yes. But yeah. the athletes today are going to make even more. There's more money in circulation. Yeah. There's more. It's big. It's a bigger market. One thing I do like about the NAI deal. So I don't. I can remember this guy's name. Like, like when he was 89 years old. There's a picture of him, like, like with a holding up a Popeyes bucket, or whatever or Popeyes chicken, or the look of his face, like, what's going on here? Mm. Ten years later, he went to like some like oh, yeah, yeah. two college. Terry. Like, some on Twitter. Papa, you don't give us an AI deal. I will never eat your chicken again. And then you got hooked up, you know. So that uh, I really like those kind of stories. Terry. That's it. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. You, man, we're getting old. Because yeah. when I saw the the most recent picture of him, I was like, damn. Yeah. He's really like he he's he's really an adult now. Yeah. Like, wow. But um, no, that, I like that example. That, that was a funny one. I like that. Yeah. So I definitely think social media AI. So all the kind of stuff, it definitely do some good, you know. Of course, it does bad stuff too sometimes, unfortunately. You know, this is the first time I even talked about this. Actually, the second time. The first time was in 2019 with um one of my old training partners, Olivia, Olivia Baker, with her dad. Um, by the way, I know you don't know Olivia. She's one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. And she's killing it now. Um, she runs an 800. I think she just signed with Adidas too. Okay. Um, and she's obviously going to med school after after she runs track. But um Man, I, I've had a great fortune of really meeting people like through track. Um, in fact, I was talking to one of my old training partners yesterday. I could be doing 75 hard together. And I, I was telling him like, like man, if we did this when we start running track, we would have broke the world record. Because <laughs> it gets you so mentally sharp. Yeah. Do you do, still do, I know you don't run track, do you ever do, do you still do track work, track workouts on a regular basis? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, in fact, for my second workout, I'm going to um, run some 200s today. Uh, but you never get the itch, like, do it, do it, like, for real. I scratch that itch in business that's now. That's gone, okay. I scratch that itch in business now. Uh, it gives me the exact same feeling, by the way. In fact, I had a really big meeting this morning. I had two really big meetings this morning. Um, just know they were really big meetings. Okay. And going into it, it felt just like a track meet. Okay. It's like, all right, well, I, be, I, I was prepping all last night for it. I was like, yeah. I'm going to go into it. I'm going to cover these points. I'm going to start this way. You know, boom, boom, boom. Feels just like a track meet. Just, just like it and um now i don't have to kill my body yeah. <laughs> to get the feeling so that's yeah. that's great so but for your business like how many people you talk to per day for your business like how do you like to do the network and stuff how do you get your, your, your business out there um well per day um uh, i do less outreach myself uh i try to focus it more um really big picture stuff but I, i'll talk to my vps every day i mean that's that that's who I spend the majority of my time talking to now, or our um, biz dev guy. Um, you know, I, I try to keep it in house, and then um, the way I set it up, I spend most of my time talking to them in house. They'll spend more time talking to, they, they spend more time interfacing with clients um, or the bankers that that work um, in in their teams in their respective teams. Um, I'll focus now. Whenever I'm talking to someone outside of the company. 
I'll, I'll spend uh, most of my time talking to like a, a big partner that we're working with, like a, a private equity fund uh, or any fund, any, any fund, a hedge fund, private equity fund, a bank, something like that, or like a, a strategic partnership or, you know, some, something like that. I try not to talk to too many clients. Anymore. And your company is growing pretty fast in both in terms of, of money and, and, and number of people work for you, right? Yes. Yeah, we we grew um over I mean literally over it was started from a low number, but we grew over a hundred percent this year. Um, yeah. The, and was that planned or just I mean, of course it didn't it didn't just happen, but like was that part of your plan to grow that fast? Yes, yes. I wanted to um grow the headcount and the um the amount of financing both over a hundred percent. Uh, yeah, I've always been thinking scale. So the people that work for like what are some of the Positions are all of them are finance people, or like you're like like marketers, salespeople, like what type of people are in there for you? All finance people and one biz dev guy. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have two um two VPs, they have a few bankers under them, and a biz dev guy who who um I would say a lot like you is just knows everybody. He knows everybody overseas, like different governments. When, yeah, when, when I met him, we were talking. He's like, "Yeah, you know, I, you know, I know this person." I'm like, you do just not just out me, like, "Oh, I just I know him." Like, you know who? Like, yeah, and then um, it got to a point. He'll intro us to certain like people. It got to a certain point. I'm like, listen, we got to talk. Um, yeah, that's just how that that's how that worked out. It, that that wasn't planned either. That that one wasn't planned. It just happened. So how did you find these people? Like, you, were you actually recruiting on like LinkedIn or Indeed, or does that come from referrals? Like, how do you find all these? People? All the above. Okay. All the above. Um, I mean, we get um, applicants every day. Very, a fraction of them I'm actually in love with, and then for that fraction that that you actually like, you have to you have to recruit. Yeah. You, you have to you have to sell them on the vision of the company. Um, that, that's one thing that has been exciting and I completely, um, downplay going into this year is that, um, recruiting is much more difficult yeah. than, than I thought it was. It's, um, it may be the number one thing actually. Also to that point, um, to all the, um, younger people that, that that's going to listen to this, um, I, what they think or what they see on TV of like running a company or being the guy, the, the big man, you know, the, the boss you know, that guy, it's completely wrong. You know, you, you spend, you work for them, you work for your team. Yeah. It's not the other way around. And um, your job is that of a sell. You are the salesperson, like you're the top salesperson and you have to sell pe people every single day. You have to sell your, your, your lieutenants, um, your vendors, uh, potential clients, the world. So they're familiar with what it is you do. Um, and it's a completely, it's almost like running for public office. I mean, you're working for the world. The world isn't working for you. And I think a lot of times um, people think it's the other way around. And it's, it is dead wrong. It makes me laugh when people say, I'm tired of working for my boss. I'm starting my own company. Like, dude, you, you're tired of working for a boss. Let's imagine your employee is your boss, your vendor is your boss, your yeah. customer is your boss, your potential candidate is your boss. Yeah. You go from one boss to have like dozens of bosses, right? Yeah, yeah. If not more. Um, and, I wish the young people would really like take that in too. Um, Cause the, the people younger than me that I would talk to um, they're all about like making the fast money doing the, you know, the drop ship, the, whatever the thing is. Make one TikTok video, get 10 million followers and, you know, get a endorsement yeah. deal somewhere. They're, they're worried about that next 10 grand. And I'm like, listen, man, if you, I know this sounds unreasonable, but you're 21 right now. This is a conversation I actually had. Like you're 21 right now. If you focus for four years, you could be in the top 5% of all Americans. You'd be the top 0.1% of all people at 25 or 26. And you have an actual brand yep. and you can, you can take off from there. They don't want to do it though. So, I mean, to a 20, to a 21 year old, five years sounds like 30. Yeah. And they just want that 10 grand so they can put it all on a down payment for a budget um, Mercedes so they can impress their friends. Yeah. And it's, um, they, they get the Toyota Corolla version of the Mercedes Benz mm -hmm. or, uh, you name the muscle car. By the way, I like muscle cars. I, I'm not, I'm not pooping it, but, um, it's sad. It is sad to the point that I asked myself, why am I even maybe, maybe I shouldn't be talking to 21 year olds. Maybe I should wait a few years and then talk to someone that's my age right now. Cause, um, all, everything that I ever tell them falls by the wayside. And I know people who will give the same advice and make, and make money doing it. Yeah. So I'm like, 
I, I don't know what things me crazy. Like a lot of young people, I was saying when I was young, you know, like I'm, I'm 55 now. Like, man, I'm 55. That's older, decrepit. But like, I have more focus energy decrepit. now than I can and I, I ever did. Right? I'm so focused now. I think a lot of young people like I got to do it now, now because I get older. I mean, I'll be able to do it right. But like, I just said, like right now, man, I have so much focus energy. Right? It's, it's insane. I w- I will press upon you to tell more people this too. Cause um, I, I talked to a lot of people that uh, I forgot the acronym that came up with it, but basically to work so they can retire and not do anything. Yeah. And um, <laughs> first of all, like it's just disgusting. I, like, I, I can't get with it. Like I, when I retired from military, I, I actually tried that. I paid off a couple weeks. Like now I'm a batshit crazy, right? Like, <laughs> I, like my kids are like other people. Like what, you retired, you're 25 years army. Just take it easy. Like I can't do it, right? I just it, I, I'll go batshit crazy. I have to do something. Yeah, I, I, I would press upon you to tell more people that too. Yeah. Um. I don't get that, that whole thinking. It, it may be linked to the communism talk we had earlier. I don't know. I don't know. I could be reaching there. I don't know. But the, the thinking that like, you're just not going to do anything. Yeah. I don't get that. So here's a good story for you. So this guy was on my podcast about a year ago, uh, Mr. Charles Ham. He was in Vietnam, he started his own company, right? You know, retired at like, 70, like 75 years old, right? Two years ago. He started to do a post on LinkedIn, like doing like little you know, like uh, witticism, you know, like country witticism, like don't do that, do this right. And he has like, like 50,000 followers on LinkedIn. That turned to a book deal. So now he's like, he just turned 77 yesterday. Oh, wow. He has, he's, he has a, his book is the number one, was the number one book in three different countries. He has his own TV show now. And he's like, he said like, dude, I'm 77 years old. I've never imagined it was happening to me, right? Yeah. Like, he's like, he's never trying to get started, right? And like, man, just do 76, 75, like doing all this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, everyone has their own path, man. Um, I feel bad. I almost feel for them, like the, that same that same group of twenty one year olds. I I feel for them because they they I mean Instagram played more of an influence in their childhood yeah. than any group, and they're just looking. They're scrolling on Instagram. They're following celebrities who, who they think are celebrities, yeah. and um, they're focusing on that one percent, and they think everyone lives that way. Yeah, it's insane. That's Jason, I have com- I even had a conversation with someone today yeah. that um, if you looked on their, their social media, you would think that like, you know, you see all the gloss and yeah. stuff. They can't even buy a plane ticket. Remember when, uh, when Bow Wow got busted out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. I always think about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, it, it was it wasn't bad unless uh, outside of the fact that he tried to make it seem like it's something it wasn't. Yeah. Um. Cause I'm, I really don't laugh at people. I'm not the guys, you know, I, I, like I said earlier, I don't pile on. Um, it is the fact that you were trying to flex, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, why? But that's, that's the world that we're in. And, and, and because, you know, things are that way, you ready for it? That's why I think business is easy right now. Yeah. It's uh, I love that, that clip from Dana White. Um, I always post it on, on my social media about how um, everyone's soft now, things are easy. And if you're like, if you're a serious worker, yeah. you just, you know, and I mean, I even had a, a hands-on deck meeting with my team um, Monday and again today about just where everything is right now, yeah. as far as like, like culturally um, and uh, as far as the economy. And if we, when we just double down, get more aggressive, be on the offense, we're going to, we're going to take off. Yeah. Cause um, people are more worried about the flash, man. Yeah. It, they're more worried about getting five, ten, let's say at max fifteen k. What does that do? How? Why? Why go for the quick fifteen when you can get the slow ten million? It's it's illogical. I don't get it. Do you get it? No, I don't. Maybe I'm tripping. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But whenever I talk to twenty one year olds that know it all, I don't. Even, I don't even know why they ask me questions because they already think they have the answer. Yeah, you know, it must be frustrating having kids. Um, yeah, no idea. But whenever I talk to them, this is what I'm getting. They're asking the question, wanting me to answer a certain way to affirm what they already think. And I'm like, why am I even talking to you? I'm busy. I don't have to talk to you. Here's one for you. This is my opinion, right? So, like, and I think that I think people are working in two categories, right? Uh, I'm making this number like. 20% of the people are like this, right? You know, I work for you. You pay me, I'll make this up. You pay me $80 an hour. Like, man, this guy's paying me $80 an hour. I, I give him at least $150 of value on that $80, right? I got to make him know that's a good investment for me. I got to mm-hmm. you know, make myself better, make the company better. Mm-hmm. Razzle, razzle. 
But I think eighty percent of the people are like he only paid me eighty dollars. I'm only going to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do anything else. And then like you take those two people and the people, the eighty percent, they wonder why they get no promotions, no raises. It always goes to twenty percent. Like I don't know. It's not about JavaScript. Like yeah, is that you find the same thing or I'm off, off on this? What do you think? I talk to people who who approach things that way. I'm not hiring that. I can tell you that right now. I need killers. I need people who are looking to go above and beyond. And it's this is what I think. I think it's 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 their job to do that. It's my job to make sure there are resources and systems in place so that there's no limit to them working in, in, in the company. So we we meet each other both ways. You go above and beyond on your part, I go above above and beyond our part so that we both can you know get you know something out of this transaction but um a lot of people are the way that you mentioned though they um look what they can take and i give you know i don't get paid enough for that or let me let me skim and see the bare minimum that i can do and um that's why they are where they are yeah. you you you'll never hear someone making 250 and up doing that yeah now, obviously though people need to get paid with a value all that kind of stuff we're not saying that we're not saying work minimum wage work that but no. If you get paid a salary, I mean, you're someone expect you to give like do your job and more than your job, you know. Oh, by definition, you have to do more than what you're paid, or you wouldn't be at the company because yeah. it wouldn't be profitable for them. Yeah. But um, yeah, most companies are not nonprofits. <laughs> literally, no, no, no. Seriously though, no, no. Literally, um, yeah, you know, is it even worth even even trying with those kind of people? Because but, I mean, but at the same time, most people are just content. They just, they just want to get by. And if they're living in that space, who's to tell them that they're wrong? Everyone can't be ambitious. I'm, I'm a nut, personally. Like, I don't expect people to do what I do. Um, just don't judge me. I won't judge you. You can be the lazy one. Just don't judge me. I'm not going to judge you. Like, I like to do baller stuff. I, I like... I, I like the stuff. All right. You know, I'm I'm into it. I'm into it. This, I want to live life on, on that other end. Don't judge me for pursuing that. I'm not going to judge you for not pursuing it. So it can, we can be cool with it. Um, just don't judge me. That's all. I won't judge you. Yes. Yeah, so I have a good friend. Um, he set up all the stuff for me, right? So he works for one of the larger corporations and they, they, he does like live streams, like the senior executives, they do a live stream, do a speech. It goes all over the country, right? He pays people on his team like $30 an hour, like tape everything down, right? And every day he has to correct, <laughs> and and like they'll leave a wire on, like like you know, and like and he's paying thirty an hour, but he really can't get rid of it because like it's so hard to find replacements, right? Yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, hiring is hard. It's uh, it's it's just difficult. It's just difficult. I mean, to the point where I I talk to my mentors uh, all the time, asking them like, how did you? But you know what, you know. Since we're touching on it, one could argue that um, it is your duty as a business owner anyway to train and to build people versus trying to find because you, you you're kind of doing the thing that you know that you say that you don't like, which is being lazy. And if you're not coaching people, if if they're, if they're steadily making the same mistakes, that's on you. Yeah. You're the leader. You, you're not. There's there's a, a fault in your leadership somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere, because it's it falls back on you. It drives me crazy, like here all the time, where like you know a, a boss will say, "Man, Jason's not working out. He's not doing this right. He keeps on messing up." Well, boss, have you told Jason that? Well, no, I, he he knows he's messing up. So your logic says that Jason's messing up. He knows he's messing up, but he's continuing messing up. Yeah. But you but you've never told him like you're doing it wrong, right? Yeah. He's both saying Jason is a genius and an idiot. Yeah. He's a genius because he knows that he's messing up, but he's an idiot because he's not. You know. Listen, it's it's your job as, as the leader to lead your team. And at the end of the day, if, if you're not getting the results you want, you got to take a look in the mirror. Uh, with that being said, it is difficult to hire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you, are you hiring right now for your company? 100%. So some of us watching this video, right? On the podcast, live stream, whatever. And like they want to work for you. What would they need to do to get attention? Or how do they how do they do that? Like, well, so how, I, how do they impress you, so to speak? That's what I'm asking. If okay, specifically, we, we'll get to the to the banker part second, but because I'm looking for a personal assistant. So for that, if someone reached out and like just offered, just just reach out and just 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 throw, just, just put it out there, you know. Um, and does that have to be in the theater area? Doesn't. 
No, they don't have to be. Okay. It's, it's preferred. But... It, it's preferred. They don't have to be though, okay. but they have to be willing. It has to be a market that we're in, definitely. Okay. And it has to be someone who, who's willing to travel. Okay. Because um, the schedule's all over the place. Sometimes it's gotta like go to California on a whim. Okay. And they have to be able to to accommodate that. Um, but to be honest with you, someone who's, who's willing to take the initiative and go above and beyond, and they can do that even in our interactions. Like if we'd never met, and you know, I'm looking for an executive assistant. Um, and you hear this and you reached out and you say, Hey, I, I, I listened to the podcast. I saw that you were looking for this. Um, I noticed that you, you tend to, you know, you, you deal with this certain type of people. Um, I went ahead and made a short list of potential, you know, partners or whatever. I put in this Excel, Excel file. I put the contacts there. I, I even put it into a zip file. I'm going to email it to you so that you, you know where to start. Um, let me know if you're planning to travel and to meet them. Cause I can give you, you know, travel dates. So just go above and beyond some way yeah. and like make my life easier for me. Cause I can tell you right now that kind of stuff. I don't even want to think about yeah. it's, it's I have a lot of my play, man. I just don't like think about that stuff. And then for bankers, um, the short of it, someone who's a team player, but competitive and can get deals done. Okay. I can get deals done. Um, for the banker part, it's pretty straightforward because it's it's all in the numbers. Any Don't, type of banker experience they gotta have, they have to like work at a certain like a micro bank or a certain, a certain amount of money in the bank or like certain industry industry back bank or just. Um, matter? I mean, there's a preference for certain industries over others. Like right now, if you if you're if you've only been a solo middle market um, real estate banker, uh, probably if we if there's other options, but if if you're that same banker. And you're willing to learn about you know other industries, then we can move because you have the right mentality. But um, we'll we'll take someone pretty much from any industry as long as they they're in they have experience in middle market banking, um, because that can be potential access to different industries that we don't have access to. How do you know someone has the right mentality? Right mentality. Oh, oh. To be honest with you, you um, I I don't think you ever really know, but you have a, a feeling for it for the, so for the first round interviews for the ones that I sit in on. It's only 15 minutes and you'll just know if you even like each other. If it's, you know, if, if it's a fit, you'd, I, in my opinion, you'd be able to tell in, in that, in that first 15 minutes. But um, I don't think you truly really know until they get into the field and you start working with each other. It's, um, it's a gamble. So if your employees, like, I'm, I'm assuming it's performance based. They have to close a number of deals on a certain number of days. Like what metrics do you have to measure how your people are doing? Yeah. Um, so we look at it on total um, finance amount um, annualized. So over the year, over the year. Um, I personally, I don't have a micromanaging style of leadership. That's not my thing. I'll, this is what I do. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. This is where you fit into that. This the, Here are the resources for you to be able to do what you do well already. Um, you let me know if you have any questions. I'm not going to be over your back. Um, let's get it done. Do you have any questions? Is, is there anywhere that I can explain further? Do you need to be coached up anywhere, you know, in particular? Um, okay. Now, let's touch base outside of work stuff so I can let me know what your plans are long term so we can potentially help set you up to do that. Um, but outside of that, let's do it. I mean, we don't have to talk long about this. I mean, if you don't have any, if you got everything, you don't have any questions. I don't have any questions. I said everything. All right, let's go do it. I don't believe in long meetings. I don't, I don't either. My, my meetings are never over 15 yeah. minutes. Not one meeting is over 15 minutes. Not even a phone call. It's, it's pointless. There's nothing over 15 minutes that can't be said in the first 15. After 15 minutes, it's just bullshit about different bullshit that don't matter. Exactly. And, you know, I, I did a lot of research. Uh, I talked to my mentors a lot about it. Um, as a leader, you your job in a meeting is to get everyone on board get everyone on the same page um direct them like this is um not as in like bark orders but like this is the direction that we're going um this is what i need from everybody this is it, this is what's going to help get you there do you have any questions if no that can be done in five minutes how you deal with this like you have your plan you're laying out and someone says hey byron like i think we should do the opposite you let them like 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 break down why they have the thinking and try to convince you or how does that work for you? No, if, if they have like feedback that way, I'm, I'm listening to them. Then, then I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bounce it off everyone in that meeting. I don't believe I have a lot of people in the meetings as well, but I'm a bounce it off. We'll get the, uh, I forgot to, to, to mention that part, get feedback from everyone involved. 
and it's not my job to be the smartest person in the room. It's, it's, it's my job to, uh, is to get the smartest people in the room, get their opinions, weigh all the pros and cons and pick the best one. Um, and that's how I would approach that. Okay. Yeah. And in, in fact, uh, I, I welcome that kind of feedback. I need it. So next question, uh, of course, don't give me the details, but have you had to, had to, had to let anyone go yet? Like get rid of them, so to speak? Yes. Can you talk about the, your process without how that work without giving too much details, of course? Hey man, it's just not working out. I mean, you're not all the way in it. Maybe um, I didn't invest all the way in you that which led you to pull back. You, you know, like the weird thing you do in your day. Um, it's like, hey, maybe I didn't I didn't invest in you the way that you were looking for. Maybe maybe it just wasn't a good fit, or you just wasn't you you were never going to be all the way in. Either either way, I mean, we both know it's not really quick and easy. Yeah, yeah. Where you go, it's it's not like a crazy thing. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Someone I heard this yesterday. A friend of mine told me this. Like it was like. Um, or how do you say it? I'm gonna let you go so you can um what do you say? Um so you can find excellence elsewhere. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I really like that. So you can find excellence elsewhere. I I really like that. And um I not, think this, this wasn't a big thing though. I think people got you no know, fire and wrong. They try to make of course it's negative and what I mean, but you can't say you're fired because it's real. You gotta make it a positive, like you know, like you have better I'm letting you go have a better opportunity somewhere else, you know, yeah, that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and that's true. Um no, nah, it hasn't been a thing so far, okay. to be honest with you. I mean, but it will be. But I would approach it the same way, though. Just, I don't think it's personal. It's just, we weren't what you were looking for, and vice versa. And so far, I'm guessing you, you've personally hired everyone that worked for you so far? Yeah. So once you get bigger... Well, no, 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 sorry. No. Um, for the uh, for, for the VPs, yes. Okay. Yeah. But um, no, I, I give my my, my, my team um, discretion to 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 make those decisions on who's going to be in their teams um i'll just they'll give me the, their input they, they'll tell me what they think and um I, I tell them all the same i mean if you feel strongly about it i sign off on it I, I i trust you i mean you're here for a reason so having said that how do you make sure that your culture stays like it is like with you not being a person to hire everyone i think a lot of companies that grow have a problem like keeping the culture the values because you know the more it gets away from you the more the culture changes yeah it goes back to to my job i mean that's my job is, is to repeat the same stuff with, with, with my team. Um, Jason, you, you just have to keep repeating the same stuff. That's it. You get every, I mean, every time I talk to uh, the VPs, I'm, I'm constantly repeating the same stuff, the same stuff. And then whenever we have like everyone, I just keep repeating the same stuff to the point that like they think it's cultic, it, it, but that's what you kind of have to do. Um and, and yes, there, there are tactics too, like in the actual like nuances of carrying out like the business. But I, I you know, I, I can give you all the good stuff. But yeah. there, there are things in place to to keep a streamlined culture, and it's not perfect. What I'm learning is that none of this is. You kind of figure and out. I'm you guessing know. all your people like all over the United States, right? Yeah. Okay. Do, um. So the 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 way we split up the company right now is um between the East and West Coast essentially, and and they're sharing in Texas. Um, so yeah, we have people in Texas, Washington, California, now, New York. So are there certain cities you focus on? Yes. Um, in what state? In any state. Um, yes. So, uh, the Seattle market, New York, New York, um, um, now Silicon Valley, that's not city, but you know, the general area, but in Texas, um, no, cause it's too big of a market. So we're looking at Dallas, Austin, and Houston in Texas. Is there such thing as a perfect customer for your business? No, not not in this line of work. No, nah. it's uh, every deal is messy. A every single one. I mean, I, the the more perfect ones just have all their their books already clean, you know, so it wouldn't take a long time. When you talk to potential, when you talk to a potential client, how quickly does it take to realize, okay, I can do business with them, or I need to get rid of this, I can't do business with them at all? You ten minutes. If there. I mean, if there was a guy I talked to two days ago, he was a, he's a fun, he was an asset manager uh, in Texas, complete asshole. And um, just knew in the first like five minutes, it wasn't, this is not a good fit. It's not going to work. And, and that made him mad, of course. But you, you kind of know. I mean, I, it's funny we have this conversation because I told my team this today. If the client is an ass to you, we're not going to work with them. I'm not going to sign off on that client because it's going to, 
it's gonna put you in this position to like you feel like you have to continuously like I don't even want to put them, I want to empower my people. So don't we just don't deal with asshole clients. That doesn't mean you know stuff can't get real sometimes. It does get we're dealing with big money. It gets real. It, it gets it gets seriously real. And and the ramifications of things going wrong is serious. Uh, I don't take that lightly. But if they're just a genuine asshole with no intention on like being any kind of malleable to work with, let them go. We won't even take it on. Can you run through like a question? Not no, all the details. Can you run like through schematics of how a process of the deal works, like beginning to end, like all the things involved in it? Like, um, a, like a, I guess I like a dummies one on one for deal making. I guess it's hard to answer that carte blanche because every deal is different. But essentially, it's a company, preferably a middle market company, that need financing. Let's say they need um, over, and, and middle market is like between hundred million dollars to revenue or actually. It's a, it depends on what the industry is not, not even industry, but it, it, it's a moving, there aren't hard numbers for middle market. Some people consider it like five to 200 uh, million in revenue. Some consider it one to a hundred. It is, it's kind of just somewhere in that, in that range. Um, but we work with small to middle market. Sorry. Um, but let's say they needed, um, uh, a credit line, like a, Let's say a ten million dollar credit line. Um, we would talk to them, kind of. We, we would assess their their balance sheet and P and Ls, um, see who they bank with, current as far as who they hold their deposits with. What do they need the money for? How long they've been in business? Uh, what's their personal situation looking like? What's the ownership of the company, et cetera? Um, and then from there, um, we'll underwrite the deal for them so they'll know like this is what this will look like. Um, this is what you'll probably have to secure it against. This is what the interest rates will, will, will come in at. This is these are the specific terms of the because we're just talking kind of top level of the of the deal. These are the specific terms. This is when it has to revolve. This is uh this is the reset period. This is if you don't do X in this you know period of time, you're gonna accrue this much. And if you default, you you can put in X in place so that it doesn't actually compound. It can just convert to uh, a note or into some form of equity, et cetera. We'll, we'll get into the actual details of the term. Um, and if they if they like it, then what we'll do is package all that up, um, which is, I'm fast forwarding it, but we'll package all of that up um, and then bring it to the right place. And that right place could be a PE fund, a hedge fund, um, insurance company, bank, et cetera. And you're doing this, are they also offering these deals to like your competitor, so to speak, and you have to compete with other people for these deals? And if you are like, you're like, okay, in order to close the deal, I'll lower the interest rate or I'll do this, I'll do that. I mean, that stuff going on. Our competitors, you ask? Yeah. Um, like close us, you're coming like through the, you're, you're coming through other companies are trying to do close the deal for this one industry, right? Well, no, no, no. Well, if, if that happened, we were partnering on it. Um, I doubt that because I mean, we, we, we charge a retainer up front. So I doubt that they're going to do that with multiple places at okay. once. And, um, what makes us, what makes an investment bank, um, in particular, like more, uh, what makes it interesting is that I mean, when you talk to us, you're talking to everybody. So there's no need for that. I mean, you, you're, when you talk to us, you're talking to the market. If, if we cannot get a deal done, it's because the deal cannot get done. Um, and that's that's not just for credit loans, by the way. That's for everything. I mean, that's for equity, um, mezzanine loans, term loans, credit loans, of course, acquisition loans. We are the company finance people. If you need money, you give us a call. And are these companies reach out to you or your business development person finding deals for you? Um, it's a combination of kind of everything. Um, he's doing that, but that's for like unclosed, um, undisclosed deals with, with governments, actually. He, he, he's doing international work for us. Um, but actually, to be honest with you right now, most of the deals are, uh, are, are finding their way to us. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's not because we're just like, because we have some special sauce. It's just we sell money, so it's, it's easy to get there. Can you talk about a deal that you closed since you started coming that you're really proud of? Um, I can talk about one that is about to close. Um, um, Cause I'm most proud of that. Um, actually, no, it's, it's not about NDA. Mo most of our deals are, by the way. Um, 
I can I talk about it loosely? There, there is a uh, yes. There's a company in Texas that's a, a energy based company that needed a pretty sizable credit line, and um, they are they have been unprofitable up until recent, and then they want to take advantage of it. And um, what I like about this deal is that it's pretty much unbankable from a traditional bank. They can't they they can't get a loan from a bank because banks they have a, a banks have really even the more risky ones they have a really tight box. Banks are very conservative, and if you don't fit into it, then you just can't get the deal done. And I'm proud about that one because I have nothing against the energy uh, industry. I, I recognize that it's important for America. I, I wish we had more energy companies here. To be quite frank with you, um, and the fact that they were unprofitable up until recent, it made it kind of had to roll our sleeves up. To, to get it done um and, and it was a pretty sizable amount too so um th that's the most recent one that i would say that i'm proud of because it was just hard to do it was it was hard to do mi mix the difficulty of it and then the fact that it was in that industry it was the first first client that that i've had personally in that industry is there an industry that you do not want to work with that you don't you say, I'm, it, I, I don't work with this industry no I'm not in love with real estate, but I'm, I'm, I mean, of course, we still take it on clients, but um, I don't think so. Because even if it's one, like for the ones that we, have, we haven't had a strong footprint in yet, um, it's still interesting. Like, uh, I'm more intrigued by the line of work, to be honest with you. There hasn't been anything, I don't know any industries right now as I talk to you that I'm like, just completely, okay. just, I just want to avoid it. You know, don't even touch with a six foot pole. Not, not that I can think of. Yeah. So back to Second Law Valley Bank, the two bank pairs and, you know, all recession, not recession. What's your crystal ball of the economy for the rest of 2023? <laughs> um, for the economy? Yeah. Or I'd say this, man. Um, if you are uh, an investor with dry powder, you, you are. Um, how about this? I'll say this because I don't know if I can if I can give my opinion. Uh, I, I don't know if I can get my qualified opinion because because I'm a banker, but um, my company, we are particularly positioned to take advantage of what I foresee coming. Um, we're getting really aggressive for a reason, and it's because um, from what I think is going to happen, I, I don't think a lot of people will be aggressive. I think a lot of people are going to pull back, you know, kind of go into their shells, and um, I think this is. I'm almost, I'm almost speaking verbatim from my conversation earlier with the team, but I think we're about to walk into a golden era of um, opportunity. I think uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about how my, how my firm can position itself to be able to take care of um, our clients because of what's uh, from, from what we foresee is to come. If, I mean, we've seen two bank failures, I think three actually um, that we know of, and it may be more, um, that can easily be 10, I, easily. I can easily be 10, like overnight, I could be 10. And there's going to be a stronger need for money uh, that companies will need. And um, we are, we're just positioned to take advantage of it. Not only are we are positioned to do that, because we, we don't just work with those kind of companies. We're also positioned to help the funds that lend to these companies, because we work with them too. We help, we help them get their money as well. Um, a lot of people don't know about that though. And um it's we're just well positioned on all fronts, I, I would say. Cause um we haven't seen anything yet. Let me just be honest. The next question. So your company's doing very well right now, 100 percent growth. But you know, things can turn our dime. In your mind, what would make your company fail? I'll I don't know if I can answer that out loud, but first, let me say this. I wouldn't say that we're doing really well because we, if we're doing really well, we're like operating like 5% right now. We're leaving a lot of room on the table and which is a good thing because we have a lot of room to go. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of my team. The, I mean, these people, like they're killing it they're absolutely killing it i'm lucky to to have these people on our team but we can be doing a lot more though for sure 100 um how do we die 
just not being able to serve our clients, to be honest with you. I, I know that's like so like that's like almost a nothing burger, but that's how we die. Cause we'll get a client that has needs and we can't serve it. If we cannot find or put together structure, et cetera, uh, like money for our clients, um, we are there's no we we shouldn't even exist. I mean, that's what we do. Um, but I just don't see that happening though. I mean, everything that we've been doing, we're well positioned to be able to do that and more. I mean, we have a goal of no matter what the client is, no matter what the situation is, as long as it meets a certain threshold, we can get them financing. Every single client. It doesn't mean they're going to love, you know, every, every, every term that's in front of them, you know, but we can get every single client some kind of finance. That's our goal. Um, and everything that we've been doing internally is uh, has been aligned with that. And I just don't see us dying, to be honest with you. I see us expanding even more. So you talk about the great things your, your people do. Can you talk about something someone recently did? Like, like man, this person like really went above and beyond. Yes. And like really like did something great. Yes, this morning. Um, I can't I can't go on specifics of, you know, of course. But um, one, of our, one person in the team took advantage of a meeting because we... This morning we had a lot of meetings, and this one that he that he ran was a it was a big meeting. We talked about it last night, then we touched on it this morning. This is on the East Coast too, so like by the time I woke up, they're already about to go into the meeting, and um, he ran that, like he he did it. Like we had a plan, he went in, he delivered it, and he just took charge of it. And I'm like, okay, that's what I'm talking about. That 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 because. That now, and, I, and these conversations that I had with him, both, um, with actually everyone in the company, I'm like, that right there was awesome. That that helps me sleep at night because now I can look at the the general landscape of what's you know because we're in a we're going through a crisis right now as, as as I talk to you, and um knowing that that he can 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 handle meetings like that is such a weight off my shoulder because I don't have to sit in on all the meetings anymore. Now I, I know like this guy can run that. Now I can give him this. He can I can give him that and not to think about. It. We just talk, we talk over the plans and he got it. No follow-up questions. He got it. He, he can run it. He can manage people too, because he has people under him. He 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 has that. He can he can take on pressure and deliver. And that happened just this morning. Yeah, people like that are so invaluable to you. Like well, Jason, you have no idea. It's uh it's everything. Cause I have to think about everything and if and the less things i get to think about is better for me so it's i'm lucky so next let's suppose you're asked to like to talk to a bunch of night curators right and you and then when you talk about you know, what skills they need in the future what they need to learn what would you tell these night graders being able to handle pressure in my in my opinion that's number one um that's number one. And number two, um, the number one skill, actually, no, forget pressure. Number one skill, you need to have the skill of thinking big. Um, I, mean, I think I think the conversation should start in there. You need to be able to think big. You need to think past everyone to your left and right. You need to think bigger than me. You need to think bigger than everybody and and stay there. Like live in the clouds, and never come down. Um Cause think about it. Ever from ninth grade on, you get told things you can't do from your teachers, parents, friends, everything. That's for other people. That's for you know rich people, the one percent, whatever. No one from this neighborhood ever did that, you know, or stuff like that. Or yeah, be be realistic. You know, your father's a janitor. You'll be nothing more than a janitor. Yeah, they use the R word, realistic. You know that. Be realistic. To me, that should be a four letter word. <laughs> what do you think, though, for the ninth grade? I would say. Um, Public speaking and do some kind of sales. I like that. I like that. Um, public speaking, like you gotta be able to get in front of people and defend something, right? Yeah. Even for a job interview, you have public speaking skills, you know, and like and and be able to sell stuff, you know. People yeah. are so underrated. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh you can change your life with a good sales position. Yes, you can. In in fact, one I would suggest more uh track athletes to start running track and pick up a sales job. <laughs> Seriously. If, if I can go back, I probably wouldn't have ran um, professionally. I would have went to Olympics, 
I wouldn't have picked up a sales job. I mean, because it has to be specific to me, right? But uh, I would have done something similar. I would have, I would have done this sooner, for sure. I think more track people should do that specifically. Um, can I talk about an idea that I've been I've been toying with? No, I can't. Yeah, yeah, you can't. Okay, I'm gonna say please. Um, I'm thinking about for Olympic athletes of starting a fund to um basically subsidize um their living, or well, you know not all of it, but give them some kind of stipend for the first year out of college so they can further career and track. Um, I think I can pull together about 10 million for that yeah. from our sources. Um, and then, um, but I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. I probably shouldn't say it on air, but it, it is something I'm thinking about though. Okay. What does that sound like? It, it, it would sound like it's 10 million, $10 million enough. It has to start somewhere. So that, okay. that 10 million would be a pilot. And would it be it's like, I guess this one, maybe one specific college at first, I'm guessing. Um, or maybe one specific like race. No, 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 no. No, with 10 mil, you can you can cover a few sports with 10 mil. Mm-hmm. Um, like these have to be qualified athletes, like coming out of school that has has a chance. So there needs to be an objective standard for them to hit. But um, I think for track, swimming, anything related, volleyball, that kind of stuff, there's something that's needed like that. That's I don't think it's currently out there. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Can you talk? About how you make money? How I make money? Yeah. Like, is it like, a certain, like you see, you have an upfront fee or like you get charged an interest rate? Like, how, how do you make your money? Um, it depends on the type of deal. Some, some deals we make it over the lifetime with an actual loan. Um, some, it's just purely off of the, um, it's, um, a, the percentage of the, of the size of the transaction. Um, but we work so like okay, okay, I can't give names and stuff, you know, be specific, but like we're gonna deal right now where we are actually foregoing the 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 upfront fee, the the closing fee, and we are gonna be the exclusive uh broker of record for that fund. So we'll, we're gonna get them from I mean, okay, I can't I could I can't can't say the exact amount, but we're gonna get them over 50 million. I'll put it out. And then for all the deals that they do um, from that fund, because this is a fund client, from all the deals they do from that fund to, you know, whoever their client is, we'll be the exclusive broker on record, and then we'll make it up on the back end. Okay. So every um, every deal is different, but the majority of them is an upfront fee um, with the rest due at close. What happens if you get like a, a client alone and they default? Are you responsible for the loan or how does that work? What, no. what, what kind of risk do you have with that when that happens? No whatsoever. I mean, it's a bad look for us because we we put together a deal with a client that didn't perform. But that that's um, I mean, that's outside of our control and things happen. What were the reasons that they, you know, default? I mean, they, anything could was it COVID? You know, it um, but no, we're we're not we're not person liable for that. No, no. We're intermediaries, right. honest brokers. So right now, what what uh, what do you do for fun? Um, if I say a word, you know, that, that made me seem like that guy, but, um, the, the art and the chess and stuff. Okay. Um, and I do go to a lot of parks. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not gonna say a park cause I want people to go to the park. Um, and I, I work out every day. Okay. I mean, that, that's like how I really unwind. Um, are you, love, are you like the first in the morning workout guy or middle of the day, or does it really matter? Or whenever you can find both, time? Both. I, I, some days I do like first thing in the morning and then in the middle of the day. Um, but when I'm lucky, I, I'm blessed to be able to say whenever I want, I mean, I can go work out whenever I want. That, that is one good thing about being an entrepreneur. Like, you know, like, like you can like, like after this podcast, we need to go have a beer if you want to. Right. Mm-hmm. But then again, the cost is probably to work later tonight to catch up on the time we missed yeah. you know, drinking the beer, you know? Yeah. You, you, you said, in fact, it's, it's awesome being an entrepreneur. So, I mean, I do, um, the five critical tasks that I learned from Andy, Andy Priscilla. So that's how I set my day up. I just I just do five things that's work that's work related that's going to advance everything forward. After that, I'm just playing coach or like taking care of an emergency, which happens every day. But um, just you know doing that kind of stuff. But um, but that's how I set my day up off of, you know, what did I get done, not how how long did I work today. Now, some days that means like <laughs> from the from the crack of dawn to, you know, past midnight. But um, it doesn't even feel like work, to be honest, because it's just, I don't do the same thing every day. Every day is different. Yeah. You know, every, 
only thing that's like consistent are are the meetings, like these fifteen minute meetings, like Mondays and Wednesdays. Outside of that, every day, comp- everything after that is completely different. So, how do you know, like, when you, you want to be an entrepreneur, like, and, and specifically in, in the banking or finance industry, when does that click for you? I knew that um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was a kid. Um, I was in middle school, high school selling candy. I mean, that's, I didn't think about it. It wasn't like, I'm doing this because I want to be an entrepreneur. It was, I need money. I have $2. These air, this pack of eight airheads costs $1.25. I'm going to, I'm going to buy them and sell them each for 25 cents. If they want more than three at a time, it's three, $4 and just built it up that way. So it wasn't like, I want to be an entrepreneur. It was, I have ideas. You know, I, I know how to arbitrage something to make money. I, I understand that there's a um, uh, a time value to um, convenience. So, like, if you're selling candy in school, you can charge more than if you were at Walmart. Because when you're at school, it's harder to get harder to get food. So you can take advantage of it. You can arbitrage that. Um, but specifically for the investment space, I knew that um, ever since I was, like, a junior in high school, I want to be, like, an investor somewhere. Uh, I just always, I just always knew it. What advice do you have someone who's out there? Like, they're not an entrepreneur yet, but they have this idea. They're, they're playing around with the idea. They know they want to do something entrepreneurship. What advice do you have for them? They want to do something entrepreneurship? Yeah. They've they had an idea. They have no idea what to do. Like, oh, it's not for that's if that's where you're at, then don't do anything because you shouldn't want to, you shouldn't want to do an idea because you want to be an entrepreneur. You should, um, it should be the other way around. Like, you 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 want to you you want to solve a problem you should start it you want to solve a problem um and if you let's leave the e-word out of it because like it's so like muddy now everyone wants to say they're one and they're not like you're not an entrepreneur you just you have a side gig you you have a you have a fiber account you're not you're not an entrepreneur you're not really taking any risks or like paying people or you know anything like that you're not putting it out there on the line you know, you're not doing that stuff. You just, you just don't like your job, really, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, you should be focused on solving a problem, in my opinion. I'm, I'm no expert. You should be focused on solving a problem. Um, and if you don't have a problem to solve, if you're in it for the money, then entrepreneurship isn't for you. Because to be quite honest with you, when you first start, there is no money. In fact, you're going to be in a negative. You're going to be spending money and not making any. And it's, it's funny because you, you're in it only to make money. So you're going to quit. That's why so many people quit because they, they didn't, they were solving a problem. They were just trying to make money. Um, and by the way, most people, most people are better off being entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs um, as they should be. Who wants to take on all that risk? You, you know how stressful it is to be an entrepreneur? I often say like, you often like, you, like, we need mental health checkups. So, you know, a, a craziness checkup if you want to be an entrepreneur, right? Because you can't be like a perfectly sane people a person, I think, to be an entrepreneur. Jason, I wish you knew how I agree. I wish you knew how often I almost have panic attacks, man. It's uh, well, that's why I have to like break, go work out, to unwind, because um, it's so stressful. It's not even funny. It's, it's um, it's just not for everybody. You have to be able to deal with everything, all at once, everything. You have to be able to have a clear mind with everything going on, make very critical decisions that that are dire, like do or die. If I make the wrong decision, we're out of business, you know, that kind of stuff. And now you're out of business, those people you hired, their family depend on their paycheck. So then I know. You, you put all these people out of, out of their homes, potentially, for some, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not something that people think about when they first get into it because they just want to make money. They don't think, they don't realize that, okay, if you're starting a company and you're leading people, you should be focused on leading people, by the way. Um, but if you're leading people, you have to make decisions with literally their kids in mind. Yeah. Literally. Literally, their kids in mind, and that's why, like you said, if you're the CEO, you have to be the number one salesperson, right? Because you have mm-hmm. to bring in the business. Yes, and then yes, and then you have to sell. You have to sell your people too. Um, you work for them, so you have to convince them why they should submit their future, you know, car decisions, college decisions, um, everything, everything, like just everything. They have to believe in you that much to be able to 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 rock with you, and um. If you actually care, if you're a human and you actually care about your people, that's a lot to take on. 
Yeah. It's, it's an honor to take and it most on. Most people can't handle their pressure, to be honest. That's why most people are entrepreneurs. And, and that's why I would never, um, even at least publicly, I, I would never like shame another, same way with like for an athlete, I would never shame another entrepreneur because I understand like, I don't, I don't have to talk to them to know like they're they're under the gun. Like they are under the gun. It's everything's high pressure. I don't even want to look at my phone right now because I, I have it on do not disturb. I know once I pick it up, it's it's going to be more fire set, you know, but that's the life though. I, I like living life on the edge like that. It's, <laughs> it gives me joy. I don't know why. It, I love it. I, I don't know why. So besides working out, what are those other ways you take care of yourself? Um, you can make the case I don't take care of myself. Um, and when people ask me a question, I say I suck at it. It's my answer usually, you know, because I try to get better. Everyone at it. likes you though. Everyone like you could just pick up the phone and call people. Yeah. Um, how do I take care of myself? I I, I don't know if I do, man. I, I really don't know if I do. I mean. I'm so locked in. I'm always thinking about like what's going on in the world and like the company and stuff that like it just consumes everything. Like, there's never there isn't a second to go by where we spend the majority of the time talking about it. Like it's all I think about. Um, I don't really spend a lot of time outside of that. I mean, I work out, do the art, play chess. Uh, I do I, I do love to read and write poetry as well. I love to read in general. I, um, I read about fifty books a year probably. Um, that's kind of it though. Okay. That's kind of it. What's your long-term vision for your company? Um, yes, we we are going to be a billion-dollar company um, that can solve any financial solution uh, for a small to middle market company. Nice. And then, well, you already answered this uh, pretty much in the interview, but can you go more details about your company, like how it got started, like what you focus on now? Yeah, started as a um a commercial real estate brokerage, um, well loan brokerage. That that's how it started. Um, it was, it was as simple as just calling as many banks and credit unions and private lenders, understanding what they needed or what they were looking for, um, for for their loans. And that's that's how I realized that every bank, credit union, and different and private lenders were different. Before that, I thought every every bank was kind of the same. Um, so I found out what they were looking for. Then I'll, I'll um, talk to, I'll reach out to as many people as I possibly could, went to every networking event, did all the stuff. I mean, this was like ground floor, like day one. And um, kind of told them what I did. It was just focused on real estate. Then I, so early on, I noticed that um, even for real estate clients that there was the commercial mortgage and then there was the business that needed financing as well. Then got into business financing and then fell in love with that part higher margins too, by the way, for, I mean, just to be honest with you. And, um, so now we're in a space where we, we, we do primarily business and then, then we branch into different industries in, in business from there, but I'm fast forwarding. Um, so now it's primarily, I'll say 80% of our book is business, the rest being real estate. Um, but that's how I got started though. And, and that's on top of like reading as much as I possibly could on the topic. I mean, really reading, really reading. So what are you doing? You have to have some kind of certification, come with a license, or can anyone just start a company? Um, doing what you're doing. If if you are um if you if you if you are dealing in securities, you you need to have a serious license. But we don't we don't deal in securities. If you're doing um just the um the loan part, if you are in California, I believe uh, uh I forgot. But if if you're doing that and you're lending, which we don't do, and you're lending, then you have to be licensed for it. Um, but but specifically for what we do, there's no license required um because we don't lend from our own balance sheet. And uh, we, we don't deal anything with securities. Okay. Um, so next, so you want to be a billion dollar company? We're going to be a billion dollar company. You, you company. We become a billion dollar company. Who were you prepared to be at that level? You want me to say that out loud? Yeah. Sure. Um, it would definitely be the Goldman Sachs of the world. Okay. And JP Morgan's. Uh, uh, well, well, I guess you already have like a path, like your, your, your vision board showing how you're going to go to each step. And get to yes. That. Yes. Yes. In the future, I mean, I definitely want, I have to change what's in front of me, you know? Um, I mean, I never, I didn't imagine us being able to work with the actual lenders that we broker from as well on, on, for their financing, for their funds. I never even imagined that up until recently. So as an opportunity that, that just brought itself and we had to just change with it. 
Um, but yeah, no, there's definitely a path. I mean, I could see us getting into wealth management, probably be through our acquisition, most likely. Um, and to be honest with you, probably most, if not all, different lines of um uh finance business. Um uh, the, the plans to be a full-fledged um bullish bracket investment bank. And do you prefer like I guess that allows like to hit singles over and over or, or hit home runs or a combination of both. I prefer to hit a bunch of singles first. Okay. Um, Cause you got to keep the lights on. Now, whenever we get that Homer, you take advantage of it. But the, the plan is, is the plan has been to do a bunch of singles, then a bunch of doubles. But then, you know, throughout all that, when that, when that, when that Homer comes, you still never, take advantage. Well, you never know that single might turn right inside the park home run, right? <laughs> no, seriously though. No, you, there's a lot of truth to that. And don't get me wrong. We do have the home runs. We do have it, but um, we're not, we're not affirm that banks on it though. No pun intended. Cause it just, there's a, there's a lot of nuances we have to get into, but like it takes a lot of time and trust. Um, and you can't fast forward that part um, to get that home run type of client, but in the, in the, in the intermediate though, singles and doubles for sure. And it would build a, a reputation from there. Think talk about this, like an entrepreneur, like, not even day to day, but sometimes hour to hour, one hour, like, man, I'm crushing it. Next hour, man, it's crushing me. Like, how do you deal with the up and downs, the emotional roller coaster, so to speak? I'm so glad you asked that question because that's a real thing. So, like yesterday, killed it up until like the last hour, then kind of just, um, you know, on the days that are like particularly more difficult than others, I kind of laugh because I'm, I'm fortunate to, to come from the sport world where like that just comes with it. Some days you're on, some days you're not. Some days you're kind of in between. Some days you, you know, you're better in this area. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of all over the place. And I learned that skill from track. So now I can just carry over into business. Like, what I want is a functional, like, trending average. That's what I want. I don't want one day to be, you know, Superman, the next day to be depressed. I don't want that. That, that I can't deal with. Um, now, I do understand, it's, you know, it's, 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 there's going to be very, Variance, but as long as that average is trending upwards, I'm good with it. But whenever I'm feeling down specifically, though, I just laugh because I know it's part of it. This is what it is. Like, this is just what it is. I mean, I started a business when I was sleeping on the couch. I was just laughing about it because I I'm confident in where this is going to get to. It's not where I'm at right now, you know. And I appreciate the journey again because I, I experienced it with track, and you have to. That's another reason why I say a lot of people aren't entrepreneurs because they're not willing to, to go through the sleep on the couch days. They want a Lambo next week. Yeah. And um, that's just not going to come. But um, I'm expecting, I expect everything to go wrong anyway, that whenever something like it's just not perfect, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm, it's like, oh, it, it could have been worse. Yeah, I saw this on TV one time where Tom Hanks was talking to a, different, a bunch of actors he talked about how he lives his life. He was like, you know, like a lot of times, like stuff doesn't do good. I'm no, I, I didn't get a rose and it's going bad. I think this shall pass, right? And he also says, yeah. on the first hand, like the thing's going great. This also shall pass, right? Yeah. So you got to think, no matter how good it's going to get or how bad it is, it's not going to stay the same. He is a stoic. Um, I think that was wiser than he even uh, realized when he may have said that. But um, but no, you kind of have to play it that way because I mean, you can't you can't start believing your own hype. Because you're gonna get humbled. It's gonna happen. It's only a matter of time. Yeah. Often I say it to myself, I, I've said this a lot too, like believe in yourself, and even when you don't believe in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like you gotta have belief. And even, even you're like, you're like, man, I can't do this. What I'm doing. They're like, oh no, actually you can't do it, right? You, you know, whenever I'm lacking confidence, I listen, I, I'm extreme. I listen to the speech that Alexander the Great gave um to his people after they had conquered uh they were on the precipice of, of going towards Russia. And this is after they had left Greece all the way forward past the health spot. And I mean, this is by, there's not no armored cars, no boats, no ships. It's like this all foot power back foot then. and horses. Yep. And um, I mean, we're not going to touch on that campaign because it was incredible. And that's books, volumes of books have been written on how great that was, but I have I have the speech on my phone of the speech he gave to his men when they didn't want to go any further, when he needed them the most. And um, I mean, the balls on this guy. He he was a, a kid then. He was like, I think he was 27, actually. 
um, around that, 27, 20, 26. And um, it's so inspiring. And it, it basically, I mean, you can, you, you can, you can draw to a lot of downfalls of his leadership because he was temperamental, you know, et cetera, child, whatever. Um, but the guy had balls. And in this speech, he basically is telling them like, this is what I have done for you. This is how you're acting towards me. You need to get it together. You need, either you get it together or you can go back home and tell your wives that you quit on your country. And I mean, that shit was hard, man. Yeah. You should listen to it. It's I'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah, send it to me. It's um, it's incredible. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's incredible. It makes. I like to think that I'm a you know that, that I, I get after it, yeah. but every time I listen to it, I'm like, damn. I mean, he did that, <laughs> and I'm just doing the small stuff. Like, I I can go harder. You gotta conquer the world of 27. He much. almost did. He, he almost he almost conquered the known world. He almost did. He almost did. Do you know that story, by the way? I don't know. He died under very mysterious circumstances. No one. I know he died like 32, 33. He, like yeah, he, he died at 32, but no one knows the, the exact cause. It's believed that he got poisoned from someone in his team, from his camp. And um, he has an incredible campaign. Um, who's who's the leader of the Mongols? Uh, uh, Genghis Khan? Genghis Khan. Yeah, so I was talking to a guy in the gym yesterday about this. Great guy, by the way. We'll get to that another time. But um. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start doing more research on Genghis Khan now, because he told me that like he was up there with Alexander the Great. Now I looked at it. Um, I actually used ChatGPT to to get some quick facts to compare and contrast them. And um, from what I understand, he lived to be older. He was more calculated. Um, but um, the one of the biggest difference between the two was that Alexander was um was brash and uh just hyper aggressive not to say the mongols weren't but they uh they were more culture driven now they had a culture of savages yeah. don't get me wrong they were savages they were they were brutal savages but it was more um streamlined through their culture where alexander the great they, with alexander the great they he he spent so much time like it was like a hyper growth model they were just taking over everything he was like the startup mode you know, yeah all the time yeah yeah exactly they were just taking over they were just They'll, they'll show up at your front door. Either either you you can see defeat on the spot, or we're going to kill everybody, and 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 um and, and burn your land like in the wake of it. Um, it's I don't know. It's I'm gonna send you that speech later. Yeah, it's incredible. I think another difference part too is like I said, there's really any known descendants of Alexander the Great. Where suppose again, it's kind of like one of every ten people in the world is like from him some kind of way. You know, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've always been real big in Roman history, like how that played out. I've always been a big fan of that, right? How, like, you know, they conquered the world and all the infighting, you know, had all these, sometimes they had bad emperors, some good emperors, you know? Yeah. There's a book on that. Um, I think it's called The Fall of Nations or something along those lines. Um, it's, it touches on it touches on almost every Yeah, you're talking empire. about uh, the, the fate of nations, I think. No, fate about, of empires or yeah there's a book book about roman history it's like a the rise and fall of roman history by gavins i think no it's not it's not that one okay this one it it talks about um a bunch of different civilizations over the years and the cycles that they go through whenever you kind of start as bandits you take over you, you know you become a strong nation mm -hmm. then you become so strong that your people become weak mm -hmm. then you, you start to end fight and then, yeah. then you know that that cycle yeah. When I read this book, I didn't realize that so many, this example has played out so many times yeah. over history. Yeah. But um, what made me think of that was the Roman one. That's, that's what happened. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's so, it's so um, common with what we're seeing today. It's like, it's almost like we're wrong. Yeah. Almost down to a T from the fiscal policy to politicians, to culture literally yeah. everything to yeah. the focus on um, the hyper focus on sports it, that's where the bread and circus phrase yeah. came from um everything yeah it, it's, it's crazy how compared we're all to the roman empire you know can i speak to that bread and circus yeah. by the way um i talk about this with my best friend a lot um it blows my mind that like because you know i was in business mode i'm thinking about how to, how to lead these people i would get into new markets what makes them tick? How can I help them? What can I do? You know, that kind of stuff. Then then, then you, you take that, you extract it to like macro themes, like what's going on in the world? Um, 
you know, just, just serious stuff going on in the world right now. And it occupies my mind every day, all hours of the day, every day. And it blows my mind that I'll talk to someone and like their level of thinking isn't past like a new Starbucks coffee. And it's like, they'll call you intense. I'm not saying I'm not, but they'll call you that as if like something's wrong with you. When you're just in the actual world and you know, like you're focused on real things and they just, they care about Fortnite, a Starbucks coffee, the Cowboys game, and like um, uh, a Meg The Stallion concert or a Drake tour or, or, or whatever. You fill in the blank, whatever, whatever the gossip thing is. And it blows my mind, man. It blows. I feel like I'm the crazy one. I feel like I'm in the matrix sometimes. I'm talking to people. They're not even concerned with anything past like whatever's arm lift to them. It's, I'm like, what in the world? Do you see this at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely, no. I mean, like back in the Roman history times, like, you know, the empire, empire, the empire, you know, like, they're green to all the people to set them up, right? Because mm -hmm. like, as long as we keep them fed and entertained, fed up green and entertained with gladiator fights, we get whatever we want to, you know? The same to, thing goes through today. To the point that they'll actually, they'll fight amongst each other about the entertainment that they're, you know, spectating. And don't even give a damn about, you know, who their senator is. Mm -hmm. Who their senator is. How many people can't even name their, their city councilman or senator or, you know, school board attendant or like, you know, what the case may be, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you give them alcohol and some entertainment and yeah. you can have that knife. You can take the knife from behind you to out front. They don't even notice it because they're not even looking. They're not paying attention. Yeah. It's, um, it's depressing. But that's why business isn't competitive right now. And for the competitive people, the aggressive people on offense, you just get ahead. Yeah, I, I hope younger people are listening too, because they if they took this time right now to get off Instagram, and TikTok, and just focus on something, build it up. World is yours. Yeah, and it's a shame, like you know, even the presidential election, like most Americans don't even vote on that, and then even less voting, like you know, the matter to me, like that really matter, like you know, state representative, city councilman, you know, local election, you know, because you think about it. The run of the president, you know, like it does affect you, yeah, but you know, the president is so macro. Your man. local city council probably matters even more, you know. Yeah, the president is so macro. People will they'll fuss and fight about macro stuff, but not even make their own bid. What, what can you say? I mean, it's crazy. So, what's your plan to continue to have your this great drive you have? Like, you think you, you always have it, or is there things you do like? Like, I want to say mind tricks, like mental things you do to make sure you have this drive all the time. I don't think I have a great drive. I, I do appreciate that, though. Um, but that's why I do things like 75 Heart. Mm -hmm. I do at least twice a year. Um, if, if Whoever doesn't know it, it's a program. It's a mental toughness program. It's not a, it's not a fitness challenge. It's, um, so you work out twice a day. Uh, one has to be outside. Both have to be at least 45 minutes. You have to drink a gallon of water, no alcohol, progress picture, and read 10 pages of a nonfiction book. Um, and you do it for 75 days and it gets you mentally sharp in, in short. And I always look for stuff like that um, um, combined with like the type of books that I read to make sure I'm just mentally firing on all cylinders. Cause I don't, I don't think I'm mentally tough at all. I, I think I constantly need to work on it. Actually. I think I'm mentally soft. So if, you, if you're mentally soft, good Lord, how mentally soft the rest of other people are. There are words that I don't want to want to say over the, over, over there, but um no, most people are soft, in my opinion. Yeah, they are. In my opinion. I think I'm just less soft than the average person. So how do you how do you manage this, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur business owner, you know, you got to do your networking, get your word out there. Then you got to also focus on your company. How do you, like, I think a lot of people, like, network too much or they focus on the company too much, you know. How do you make sure you have a good balance of doing both of them? That's a really good question because it's, it's something that I constantly try to, like, figure out. I now only do, like, networking that I think is, like, ultra critical. Also, by the way, if you're hiring right, if, if you're recruiting right, rather, that is a form of networking because you what you're what you're bringing on is their network of people and that gives you access to whoever they have access to if you're doing it right. Um, but as far as me showing up at one, it has to be like a, a serious one. Tomorrow I'm going to be at one with um, with with a lot of family offices. Needless to say, that's that's, you know, that's yeah, one that's, that, that's big time for you. Yeah. Um, the last one before that was like three weeks ago, I think. I can remember um it was with family offices and a lot of vcs um so like that's something that i'm gonna be present for but like the 
the run of the mill 10x ones or the you know those kind of slimy real estate stuff uh or like you know i I just don't have time for it to be honest with you it's it's, i actually lose money by going and stuff like that because that's time that i could have been working on something that's actually you know a profit center for the for the for the firm um but no it it's something that you know I'm, i'm constantly trying to work on i try to do at least at least one or two a month at least of some form but um if I'm doing my job well within the company, that is a form of networking. Um, but you have to know how to leverage other people and, you know, but I want to give all the good stuff out. Yeah. yeah. But that is a thing though. So what, next, do, what do you do? Uh, Cause, Cause you know, everybody, I mean, yeah. I should be asking you, you're the networker. So, yeah. I mean, it's weird. Like I'm an introvert. Like I've told someone one time, like I'm the type of person, like I would like to go like, um, like a networking event or go to Starbucks and just observe people, right? Like, yeah. I, I, I don't have to talk to anyone, right? I, I went to a networking event last night. Well, I'll go with any networking event and just meet three new people, right? And once I have three people, sometimes I leave, sometimes I stay around, you know, but yeah. But it's, it's a hard balance, right? Because I think definitely people can get, you can become a networker, entrepreneur, so to speak, right? And never build anything. <laughs> and you definitely got to go with stuff that, that you can add a value to and it can add value to. Yes. Makes any sense, right? That's why I, I, um, when I first started, I, I would do, I would go, to, I mean, this is how I got started. I literally went to, um, meet up and would just, I, I still do this. I still do that sometimes. I'm going to meet up just punching startup or like something I'm interested in doing. But I would do things three to five times a week. Yeah. I would just fill it up and just shake as many hands, follow up with coffee. Just, just, just hustling. I mean, that's how it started, but I just don't have the time for it. Anymore. Yeah. I just, I just don't have it. It, I don't even have the time really a lot of times like to even take certain calls even I just because <laughs> what I'm learning is that even talking about things that's not conducive to what it is that you're actually focused on it you lose money doing that you you lose money doing that because it's less time it's literally less time spent working and or it just takes your focus off now you need to learn how to control your focus yeah you learn how to snap back which is a thing. These are real tactics, by the way. You have to learn how to do that because you can have a conversation, childhood friend call you about some stupid, you know, oh, did you hear some gossip? Did you hear about X, Y? You're like, oh, really? You know, you get caught up in it. it you know, you, it's hard not to get caught up in it if, if it's good enough. Then you get off 30 minutes later, right? Because, you know, you're going to talk for 30 minutes. So you lost 30 minutes. Then you're going to lose another 30 minutes because you're like, damn, that really, you know, Bobby really did that back back in the old hood, you know? And it's just time out of your day. It, it it's uh it's not conducive to what you actually want to do. Um, yeah. So I talk about this with my team a lot. You we have to learn how to control our focus. You, you have to learn how to control your focus. I know that sounds like thematic or like kind of fluffy in the air, but it's a real thing. You gotta learn how to control your focus because uh it it can be tough. On average, how many hours of sleep do you get a day? Uh, at most six. Six. Okay. Yeah. What about you? I, I work best half seven. Okay. Like, well, it was funny, like, if I get three hours of sleep or, like, I, I'm actually worse off getting more sleep than less sleep hmm. for some reason. Like, like, suppose I sleep 10 hours, I'm, like, groggy, I'm done the rest of the day. I, I can go, like, maybe a week on, like, four or five hours of sleep, but optimally, I need seven. That's, like, my sweet spot. So, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever slept seven hours outside of times I've been really sick. Yeah. I can't sleep long. It's hard for me to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to stay asleep. Is that because your mind never starts off? I think so. Yeah. I have yeah. the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's just difficult for me. It's um it's always been that way. So um there's a term, you know, ABC always be closing. But also believe in the term ABR always be recruiting, right? So how do you like once again manage like between always closing your sales stuff and also be recruiting at the same time? I don't um I don't work as closely on the deals anymore. Uh, so you can focus more on recruiting then, bring your top your top talent in. Yes, that and um, making sure that everything is is operating efficiently. We're going in the right direction, uh, and that the culture is being instilled uh, throughout throughout the entire firm. I, um, no, listen, you know, why do why do I recruit people so that they can so I can so they can do the deal? So it's my job to make sure they get the resources, they get the direction, I'm coaching them up, answering their questions so they can actually do it. Because the more time, I sp- it sounds weird, but the more time I spend actually doing deals, the less successful the firm is going to be. 
because it's Tom. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Sa the same reason for everything else, it, even even for actually doing the deals. If I'm doing the deals, then that's I'm only one person. If, if we want to be a billion dollar company, I can't be doing all the deals. I can be touching on them, though, like from high level. I, I, I'll do the intro. If it's a big enough client, I, I got the onboard. I got it. You know, because I would say that I'm good with getting clients. I, 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 I can do that part. But then once, it, once, once they're in our, our, our firm and we're working on it together, um, someone in the company will be, be directly uh, facilitating it, making sure that all their needs are being met. What kind of sales training or any kind of sales items do you do with you for your people? Like, how does that work for you? None whatsoever. Okay. No, no, no. We won't do any of that. Okay. Um, I guess every company is a sales company to a certain degree, but I want... So one of the things that makes us different is the fact that we're not salesy. In fact, most of the times we'll tell a client, you probably shouldn't get this. Like you probably, you probably shouldn't work with us. You probably should try to make it work. We can, we can probably consult maybe, but like you probably shouldn't go, go this route. Um, Cause we really want to be their embedded advisors. We want to be their best friends. We want to be the call you make to show up to your wedding. Um, if you, I mean, you'd be surprised at things that I talk about or have had to talk about with clients that had nothing to do with the actual deal or their business even. So do your clients, they have like 24 seven access to you and your salespeople, or, or do you have like a limit? Like, no, don't contact through these time periods. Or how does that work for you? We have unreasonable limits. So like it's, it's yes, it's 24 if need be. Um, we, we have to respect our, our bankers and their families and stuff. But like, I know for me personally, I mean, I'm just on call. Even a few weeks back at a client that was having a lot of anxiety about his business. He called on a Friday. I was with another client. I was like, he called at like eight too. He, he was in, um, in Linwood. I was in Seattle at the time, not far from here. So, all right, I'm going to finish up this dinner. I'm going to come see you. I didn't get home that night. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And sometimes it just, that's just part of the job. Um, and that's just what it is. That's what makes us different, though. Willing to, to, to be their best friend when they don't have one. And um, good luck finding that elsewhere. Because I can tell you right now, most most places they wouldn't have answered the call because it's eight o'clock on a Friday. Yeah. And then if they did, can just wait till Monday. <laughs> I'm, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I think that's reasonable. We're just unreasonable in how we want to serve our clients. Do you think you'll be able to keep that mentality even when you become a billion dollar company? 100%. That's how, that's how you get there, in my opinion. Um, is it going to be like straightforward and easy? Of course not. But that's what makes us different, though. Um, it, most people just not, again, just not willing to do that. That's, that's, that's where the sweet spot is. That's where, that's where the room is. That's how you make, that's how you make it. That, that's a, that's a, um, that's solving a problem. You know, um, that's the problem that we're solving, being their best friend. Okay. So this is a new question I started asking people recently. Uh -oh. So, so you, you have people, you have mentors, correct? Correct. Yeah. Who are you mentoring? Um, I don't think, I don't want to say their names, but um, three separate guys. Okay. Three separate guys. And, uh, what ways are you mentoring? Like, like sports athletes, finance people, or just general mentoring? Um, one, uh, one, one athlete one finance actually one athlete one finance and one that's uh kind of <laughs> all over the place <laughs> and and did these people reach out to you or you found them or how did this mentor they, they reached out they reached out okay. like how do they know who you were like how did they one I've, I've known since high school okay. well, pretty much since high school one i met um at a political event and the other one dm me just dm me okay and um because I, I talk to people and I, I, I know people think like I'm, i am busy but like people think that People be intimidated to talk to me. I don't know why, but I'll talk to anybody. I talk to people in the store every day. I make a I make it a point to do that. Um, but no, when people reach out, I always respond. Always. Yeah. So these mentorship relationship, what what's what's your goal for that? Like to begin making a certain level of success, or like how's that? What's success for you with these relationships? It's all relative to what they do. What's success for them? Because I can't tell them, hey, you need to go to Olympics retire in your 20s and then try to build a billion dollar company I, I would never tell that's you know that's unrealistic so it depends on what where you have to meet people that and they're they're all younger than me so it's like what is it that you're trying to do 
or maybe that's it. Maybe you need help trying to figure out what it is you're trying to do. That could be it in and of itself. But if they're already past that part, and they never are, because you know they're, they're like 21, 22, yeah. you don't know what you want. You think you do, but you don't know. And they, you meet with them like once a month or whenever they call you, you meet with them. How that schedule for you? Definitely can't be whenever they call. <laughs> I can tell you, it, it can't be that. But um, um, once once a week, other two once a month. Yeah, and um. Yeah, so it has to be relative to whatever it is that they're trying to do. And, and, and you know, my job is just like, hey, I've been there. I, I have an idea of what you're going through. You need to do X, Y, Z. You need to, and I'll know you did it because you'll be able to get X result. Let's check in next time. I'll check the progress on how close you've gotten to that. And that's it. I'm, I'm not the parent. I'm not judging them. It's, it's not that. You know, I'm not, it's not that. It's just, hey, you need a sounding board. I've been through it. Th this is how I did it. This is what I think you should do. What do you think? Okay, well, let's try that. And we need to achieve this result. Um, next time we talk, we'll see where you're at. And is three like your limit for mentoring people? No, I'll take them on. Okay. I, what, what is your limit, you think? To be honest with you, ideally, like over 50, and I'll talk to them all at the same time. Okay. So then that way I can just focus on macro themes because okay. what they don't realize is that if you got the good macro themes, that's all you need. Right. That's, that's all you need. That's, that's really all you need. If you just focus on the big picture stuff, that's, that's where culture gets instilled. I think that's all you need. Like, would you, most people will feel weird saying Gary Vee is their mentor. But he's a mentor to a lot of people. I mean, yeah. a lot of people, I mean, some people admit it, you know, some people don't, but yeah, he's. Exactly. If you watch his daily V's, Especially from like back in the day. Oh yeah, that's like, that's like that golden shit. Like the first hundred episodes specifically. I mean, do you need anything else? I mean, you can just watch it. It's in vlog format. I know y'all yeah. like to watch vlogs. Yeah. Don't say you don't. You know, in, and he talks the walk. He walked the walk. You know, like yeah, you, you can listen to the meetings. You can. I mean, he talked to the camera. That's everything you need to know. You can, in fact, you can make a business off of watching his first hundred uh, daily V's. Uh, regurgitating stuff that he set up there and just, you know, repackage it to to younger people. You can make a business out of that alone. That's how good it is. And um, that's a form of mentorship. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I know people, they're not going to look at it that way. They still want, you know, something that they think is specific to them yeah. just so they can not do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's just kind of, but, you know, it's, yeah. it is what it is. So next, real quickly, let's, let's talk about tattoos. Yeah. So how many tattoos do you have? Uh, about 20. 20, okay. Is one tattoo that's like, like really meaningful to you? Like, Yes, the, my hand one the, um, with the, the line. Because okay. I got this at, uh, at 21. Okay. Because I never wanted, I wanted to be unemployable. So show the camera right there. Please. Yeah. Uh, I, I got that one at 21 because I wanted to be unemployable. Okay. And um, hey, so, so one more time. I, I, I got the hand tattoo at 21 because okay. I wanted to be unemployable. Okay. Um, it was it was just a big bet on, on myself. I would recommend no one to do that. Yeah, I remember back in the day, like you know, I was just say, only reason you get you should get a, like a, a neck tattoo, a hand tattoo, if you're Alan Iverson or like Lil Wayne, right? Yeah. But now it's like become more common, so to speak, you know. So. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't do that still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to pull that off in in, in my line of work. Yeah. The hand is really pushing it. Yeah. It's like really, really pushing it, but. I, I I overcompensate with that with um with with how I dress in general. Yeah. Um. Or, I, or just do the line and turn over the Olympic rings and you know like. <laughs> yeah. There, there's that. If you too. criticize it, no. What about this one? You know, sometimes I wish I didn't do the Olympic rings because yeah. um I get stopped a lot for it, and I don't think people should put me on a pedestal because of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I just don't think so. I mean, like you said, you're one of the one percent. You know, you achieve something like most people can't even dream of. The hard yeah, work but it's, you know? it's athletics, though. I just. Uh, uh, maybe maybe because I I come from it, so I look at it differently. But I just don't put it. I just don't value it the same way other people do. I just, yeah, I just like, like I told you before, jokingly, if I was you, I put that would be tattooed on my forehead. The jokingly, right? Yeah, yeah, but you don't you don't be that guy. But also, yeah, yeah, yeah keep in mind that I would argue that what what I'm attempting to do right now is much bigger than anything, um, athletic related yeah. at all. So I just don't. If I if if I was not to I I know I know coaches and. I have peers who have ran and then went to be coaches, but you know, let's just, let's just be honest. All right. If I ran track and then wanted to be a coach, 
this will be a different conversation because mm-hmm. my bet my my better days are behind. Yeah, that's just it's just a fact, right? But I don't think that's me. That's not me. Um, it's I'm, I just want to up the game that I'm playing. I want a bigger game, and because I just I just don't put too much yeah. too much weight on it. Um, but the one so the hand tattoo is the is the one that um I would say I'm most proud of. But the one that I like the most is my back tattoo because I have a wolf. Okay. A wolf howling at the moon. So the wolf, that's the animal, like the, that's the spirit animal or something? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I never, I don't know. I don't know. I never thought about that. Probably. Mm-hmm. Probably. But then you have the lion too, so maybe the lion's a spirit animal. Any animal or mammal that has passion, it just, the same way that classical art, I just have a propensity, you know, towards it's the same for that, in my opinion. So are your parents done with tattoos or you have some more planned down the road? I'll probably get more, but I haven't thought about it. Okay. I haven't thought about it in a while. Um, damn. That's a good question. I haven't, I haven't thought about that in a while. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know. Okay. Probably, though. Yeah. Probably. Can can you tell us what the, what's the biggest deal of y'all flow so far? I can see the range. Okay, the range, yeah. Between between twenty and 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 forty. Okay, so and what's the smallest deal you closed? Oh, in the range. I no, I didn't take the smallest one. Uh, it was like around, I think it was five hundred five hundred thousand. So, is a work in the process in those two? Varying deals, so it comes to sample, it's like a whole lot more time and commitment and stuff related to the bigger the deal is. It's generally about the same, um, but don't get me wrong. With, with the bigger numbers, you have to like. I guess more hand holding, way more customer service, I'm guessing. And like, there, there's that kind of stuff, but like you have to wear a nicer suit. You have to be more professional, right to the point. You, you have to handle it with more care. Mm-hmm. But like, there isn't more paperwork involved. No, it's just it's the same due diligence. But um, they need to trust you more, because a um, a thirty million dollar fuck up different than a five hundred thousand dollar. You know, it's just different. There's there's different players involved. Um, but no, I mean due diligence though is about the same though. Surprisingly enough. So where your company's at right now financially, everything I've going on. Is there a deal that you were like, man, that you'd be scared to take on? <laughs> yes. Well, n- really, no. But there's been a deal that we landed recently. Jason, I'm telling you, it is so far out there, and I can't, I can't speak to it. But like, it's it's out there, the number, and um, I was kind of ambivalent because I'm like. This is what I, I've written down. I wanted to play in this game. But then once you're in the game, it's like running track. You want to be a professional all your life. All your life. This is what you want to do. Okay. My junior year, my first professional meet was in Jamaica. I'm looking around. You know, I'm seeing some names that I have studied their races since high school. And it's like, you, you wanted this. Now you're here, you know, um, what are you going to do? And I found myself in that position recently with this because, you know, it's uh, sometimes it can be so big that it's scary, but I, I love being scared. Uh, I, I just like I'm, I'm a thrill seeker. I, I like that kind of stuff. So, Byron, is there anything that we have not talked about yet or any quests I have not asked you yet that you want to talk about? Um, no, but I do have a question. What do you want to ask that's kind of like out there that you think is pushing the limits? What do you mean? Like anything you think that I'll be embarrassed to, to answer? Oh, um, man. Um, your, um, the range of your annual income. <laughs> yeah, I'm not answering that. Okay. <laughs> but, but that's not because of embarrassment. Yeah. I just, it, it would make professional sense for me to do that. Yeah. Um, I do okay, though. Okay. Especially for my age. Yeah, let me think what else. Um, okay, here's one. What's a goal that you thought you should have met by now, but you haven't? Okay, as a kid? Any, anything. 
as a kid, I definitely thought I would be married with kids by now. I definitely thought that. But as a kid, I, you know, you, you kind of, you look at, you look at all ages differently. You look at 30, like it's stone ages. You look at 40, like you're retired. 20, you know, as in like you're an adult and you're in the world doing stuff, you know, and, you know, but yeah, I, de I definitely thought I'd be married with kids by now. Um, I'll say this though. And I never talk about my love life ever, but I will say this though, that um, everything has worked out the way it was supposed to, like everything down to it, to the point where I'm going to stop even like taking stabs at what's supposed to happen. I'm going to just have my plan and I know what I want. I'm going to do my part and see what happens. And I'm going to change with whatever is in front of me. But um, yeah, man, it, I definitely thought I'd be married with kids by now, um, especially when I was a kid, 100%. Talk about this, like, you know, it's not like, you know, the more successful you're going to get, the more people will be, like, out of your, your, your like, your market, so to speak, right? Like, example, if you're, like, a, a vice president of Amazon, you're probably not going to ask a, a lady, a Waffle House waitress for a date, right? I would. I, I would, personally. But, we, well, would you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cause so your market is still 100% completely open, then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, 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 um, don't get me wrong. I don't expect the roles. I don't, I don't expect to be the same. The roles were reversed. Mm -hmm. You know, if she was that Amazon exec and I worked at Waffle House, mm -hmm. she would, she's not going to give me, she's not going to even look twice at me. I'm handsome, but I ain't that handsome. Um, if all I care about is being with a good supportive person, mm -hmm. uh, a Christian, someone who's family oriented, um, um, that has an interesting look at the world, um, and was really supportive in what I am attempting to do, do for our family. That's that's it. It's someone I can trust. That I mean, I say that's it. But th those are big things, though. But I don't. Um, I don't care about career or okay. any of this stuff. Actually, I don't. I got the career part. Like, l listen, I, I'm already. I'm all career out. You know, I, <laughs> that career stuff. It already occupies my mind. I need someone I can trust in that we're on the same page with. And if, and if she's a good person, a genuine person, a caring person, a warm person, um, and worked at Waffle House, cool. Let's do it. Man, I said that how often you go to Waffle House, though. Well, there's no Waffle Houses out here. Oh, yeah, you're right. I always forget that, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I was going to say Denny's. Denny's. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Waffle House guy. Okay. All right. I was in, I was in um, Texas a month ago. Definitely made my way to Waffle House. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I love the chocolate the chocolate waffles. I double it up with uh, scrambled eggs with cheese, and I, I put the whole syrup thing on top. Here's a funny story for you. So me and my family just came from Italy, but I was in the army, right? So we were staying in my brother in law's house in Dallas, right? Our grandparents Texas, right? And uh, my two kids at the time they wanted to get some breakfast, right? And so Waffle House like maybe a mile down the road, right? So we go to Waffle House. They ordered like like the breakfast they had, like scrambled eggs, whatever. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was like. Can I get a piece of cheese? Like, don't ask the lady for a piece of cheese. Ask the waitress for a piece of cheese. This joker bought back a craft scene of the plastic eight stand on my car. Yeah, yeah, that's Waffle House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my kid looking at me like, what in the fuck is this? I'm surprised she didn't bring back like a piece of paper with the word cheese written on it. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. That's no, that's Waffle House. And she probably slammed it down with an attitude. Like she did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's that's Waffle House. But my that's kid why you ain't been to Waffle House since then. Like, yeah. Yeah, you know, so I haven't been in a while prior to when I just went. Uh, Cause I've been out here and um, I definitely noticed that the prices are different at Waffle House. Yeah. I'm like, damn, this is Waffle House is like, it became cool now. I remember when it wasn't cool. I remember when uh, the, the Jackson or Jaguars part of like when the playoff game, you went to the Waffle House like two in the morning. I thought that's pretty cool. You think so? And, and you think about it, you're talking about, you know, people that make money off Gary B's first 100 videos. Mm -hmm. You can make, make money just videotape in your local house and post it on you know social media probably let's I've, I've done my fair share of uh uh like in austin like sixth street um and then waffle house in uh in riverside around two o'clock in the morning and um you are guaranteed to see something interesting there yeah it without fail it doesn't like the waitress there they deserve like some kind of combat pay or something you know like, combat. like <laughs> They do serve, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um it's it's not it's it's crazy at Waffle House, especially at night. It's like Seattle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's another topic, exactly. Um, so anything else you want to talk about that we have recovered? Um 
No, we good. Actually, I'm surprised we 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 um it may not be surprising to you. I'm surprised we actually talked about track as much as we did. It's uh I haven't I haven't I haven't really talked about track like, yeah. since since I retired. I, I never made an announcement or anything. Yeah. I'm making an announcement of of retiring from track soon. Okay. Now that I think because I never even did it. Yeah. I just stopped running. I stopped running, went deeper into investment banking, and didn't even look look twice at it. Um, but because of this and us talking about it. I'm going to make a retirement announcement okay. track. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Is there anything that I can ask you? Um, You're the man. Uh, you, but let's get it. I want to get a few things out the way. I'm not successful, first and foremost. Um, I'm just not. Um, you're the man at this table right now. Like, you, you're actually the cool one. You're the well-connected one. You're the, you know, you know this, though. You know this, though. I mean, example by all of your guests. Um, thank you. It's a, yeah, it's it's an honor to sit across the table from you. Though. I appreciate this, but uh, I'm definitely not the cool one at this table right now, <laughs> for sure. No, I, I mean that though. Cool. Um, can you give us any advice on anything you want to talk about? Any advice? Yeah. Um, listen, it's hard to give advice because I never know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm I, I'm I am trying to figure things out in real time. But if I was to give advice. I would tell someone, especially younger, because I have to focus on people younger than me. Uh, I see that's where the most growth is. People older than me already think they got everything figured out. And it's like, all right. Actually, younger people do too, but whatever. Um, just double down on something and don't give up. It, that sounds basic, right? But it's not because you hear this rah-rah stuff. And, not, and I'm a big rah-rah guy. Let's get it. Uh, yeah, all right. I, I just want to be fair about that. I'm a, I'm a rah-rah guy. I'm rah-rah with my team. People that I talk to, I'm a motivational guy. That's what I do. But you need to really double down on what it is, whoever it is. You need to double down on what it is you want to do and not give up. What does that look like? It means not going out, you know, when everyone else is doing the cool thing. It's not, it's, it's avoiding certain topics. And this is very easy to, to lean into. It's easy to talk about bullshit. It's just easy. It's very easy. It's, it's avoiding certain topics, there's, uh, avoiding certain foods. You know, like just really getting serious about what it is that that you want to do. Most people aren't. Most people talk hard. They do the New Year's resolution. They work out for a week, give it up, you know, drop the diet, um, hit the bottle hard, you know, Netflix it up, gossip with the bros. Um, what's the latest song? You know, the bullshit, the bullshit. They, they're doing the thing. Um, Andreessen Horowitz had to call it the thing with a capital, with a capital T, the thing, right? Avoid all of that. Again, this to, to younger people, avoid all of that and just, just get busy. Get off Instagram, delete the app, get busy. Don't even look at what I'm doing. Cause I'm showing you stuff after the fact. Don't look at me thinking you, you getting like ideas of what my moves are. I'm showing you old stuff. All right. Don't, don't track my moves. All right get busy start doing stuff like stop overthinking it stop reading the success stuff the the memes and the the billionaire pages and i get it because i love ball and shit too i love it jason i was at a porsche dealership today all right i ain't buying anything but i'm just looking you know it's, it's, it's looking around all right I, I like being around it in bellevue i like it i get it but to the younger people, don't even worry about that. Just if you have to sleep on a couch, you know, get open up your book, write down your notes, write down your plan, pen to paper. Which that's the best advice I ever got, by the way, to write down my goals on a pen to paper with a five year plan. You know, um, hit up your five year plan, write down your goals, come up with a plan of action, do your five critical tasks. You know, work out, stop gossiping, fix the diet up, get serious. It, this is. We in it now. We're in the, we're in the game now. It, things are happening. Banks are failing. Things are happening now. People need to start getting busy. They need to stop gossiping. You need to get out of the uh, the minutia of like life. Um, stop chasing the girl. You know, stop arguing. Stop the ego fights with your boys. Stop all of it. Stop scrolling. Get busy, um, and everything will work out, in my opinion. And um, if 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 there's anyone um, that's listening to this, that's younger than me, 
or older, whatever. I don't have everything figured out. But if there's anything you think that I know, um, I would I would press upon them to please just reach out because I'll talk to anybody. Doesn't mean I'm always available, but w- whenever I can, I, I do respond because there need to be more people that is that, that are getting busy. Not enough people are busy. A lot of people are just wasting time, bullshitting. Get busy. Uh, uh, double down. Get serious. We're in the game now. Things are happening. Uh, and just buckle up. Byron, speaking of social media, can you give your show your social media so people can reach out yeah. to you? Yeah, all my social medias are the real B swag with two Gs. All of it. By the way, I had a marketing company that tried to suggest I change my name. I'm like, why the fuck would I change my name? This is my name. Like, th- this makes me me. I'm, I'm the real B swag. All right, it's, it's, you can't take my sauce. That's like decapitating me. What, what is that? But everything is the real B swag with two Gs. Nice. So Byron, thanks for doing this with me today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine. Pleasure is all mine. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. That was awesome.